Hello and welcome, ladies and gentlemen. This is Run It Back, and I am joined by the champ from the 2004 WSOP main event, and of course, many more accomplishments. But Greg Raymer is joining me today. And Greg, I could not be more excited to talk to you about the main event that I've watched the most of any main events because this was the first ever one that I watched. Long story attached to that. Most of the viewers will know that one. But first and foremost, Greg, how are you doing? And I'm going to roll the intro of the show without sound so you can just sort of get us caught up to speed on, uh, on what you've been up to. Sure, great, thanks. Um, I appreciate you inviting me onto the show. And uh, things are fine with me. We are safe, uh, you know, here at home, uh, quarantining with all this going on around the world. And uh, daughter recently read this for California. And so everything's wonderful, everyone's safe so far. And that's the main plan is just to keep staying safe and hopefully uh, get back to some real poker. Yeah, I mean, that, that would obviously be the dream for everyone, uh, for us all to be safe and then for us all to enjoy poker. But, you know, we'll have to wait and see. I think you and I are both not uh, smart enough uh, to predict uh, what is going to happen. But let, let me let me at least try. Do you think we're going to have a WSOP in Vegas this year? I'm not sure at all, but if we do, it will not be anything like it has been. Um, there's no way we're going to have, you know, events with you know, five and 10 and 20,000 entries and all that stuff. Um, a lot of those players aren't going to want to show up, even if it's available to them and happening. And, uh, you know, and I get it. It's, it's going to be really hard to stay safe until we have a vaccine. Yeah, exactly. So for the people who are joining us here on the show today, this show, Run It Back, runs twice a week on Tuesday morning and on Thursday night. And today we are watching the 2004 WSOP main event. And just like I did with Chris Moneymaker last week, we are watching the day before the final table. The final table we've all seen a thousand times. Everybody remembers what happens at the final table. But this show is all about the day before the final table. So Greg will dive into, you know, how you were feeling in the moment, but also the lead up to the event, how you got to where you are now and everything else in between and for the people in the chat don't forget to like this video subscribe to the channel and let me know what your questions for greg are and i'll try to weave them into the show as we are starting out with marcel lusk at the feature table he of course one of the most colorful guys from this main event um greg we're seeing marcel lusk at the feature table here there's there's about to ha about to be some epic moments um when did you first became aware of marcel and and you know you guys must have you know had some kind of relationship over the years yeah, I didn't know him personally until this main event in 04, but I had heard about him. I mean, he was a famous poker player on this side of the of the Atlantic as well, not just in Europe. So he was someone who was already well known. Um, I mean, you know, we know the result. He ended up finishing 10th here in 04, but I think he was something like 11th or 12th, either it was the year before, or the year before that. And uh, but of course, he is such a great character and such a fun guy and people like him so you know he was pretty well known anyways right and then there's a lot of uh, chatter and banter going on between him and harry dimitriou at this table um let's start with the run-up for yourself in this 04 main event um this was not your first uh, rodeo at the world series of poker you had already played i believe maybe two or three times in in prior years mm -hmm. um talk to me your, your first ever wsop how did you get to play and how did you end up in vegas for that one Sure, I played the main event in 2002 the first time, so that's the year Varconi won, and I went reasonably deep. Um, you know, even though there was like over 500 entries that year, they were paying 45 spots, and I finished like 80th, give or take. So, I mean, they're not recording that, and I don't remember exactly what it was since it was not really very close to the money. It wasn't like we could go look it up. Um, and I went out on a bad beat so to speak and and all that but still you know i played now for several days and i was just like wow for good or bad this has been so great i'm never going to miss this ever again right if i'm not in the main event every year the rest of my life it's because i can't be and that's held true since then until this year <laughs> <laughs> and of course if we end up not having a real main event that'll be the reason because i can't be in it that'll be the only reason Right. So then 04 rolls around. Did you, 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 you already decided you were going to play, but were you playing satellites? How were you sort of going about getting into the main event? And then mm -hmm. how did the first couple of days go? Were you just, you know, cruising along major ups and downs? Like, what was the tournament like for you? 
yeah, to be honest, I mean, we all have some downs, but it was mostly ups. So, I mean, I ran really well. You know, I, I felt like I was playing well, but things were going my way also. Instead of trying to minimize the damage when I was getting beat, I was trying to maximize the amount when I was winning. And that's always a lot more fun to be doing that kind of strategy thinking as opposed to, oh, you know, like when do I need to get away from a hand because I'm, you know, might be beat or any of those things. So it made all my, I mean, I was just, I was always a big stack basically the entire tournament. You know, I finished day one with a way, way above average stack and same thing every other day. Wow. So I wasn't at like the top, top of the chip counts. So even if you could go back and find out some list of like, oh, here's the top 10 or so leading stacks at the end of day one or two or so, I don't think I was in any of those until maybe at least day three, maybe day four before I was on that list. But I was still always well above average. Right. And, uh, you know, just things like, you know, people just paid you off a lot back then. Um, that really was the thing for the good player. It was, you know, not how do I avoid risk or anything. It was how do I win the most against these players who are going to do something silly. And so it's like, oh, in level two on day one, call a raise with a pair of eights flop a set and get in the other 150 big blinds after you flop a set against pocket kings right yeah no i mean i haven't been around poker that long but even i remember those days that was that was pretty easy and you could like make massive bets and people would never fold their over pairs a uh, quick shout out by the way to the people in the chat i see um andy joe andres asher i see blackbeard brian mitch uh, all on youtube and then on facebook i see stan bobby ryan lloyd senate all in the chat grover uh, just tons of people there to shout out let us know how do you remember the 04 main event what were your favorite characters and you know what were some of the memories that stand out maybe i can ask greg about some of these moments and greg one of the questions that has already come up twice is are you good friends with madison now because you guys obviously had some beef back and forth back in the day and what was it like in the moment to have sort of a verbal back and forth going on with all this money on the line and, and so much pressure going around well, if you remember, there wasn't much verbal from me. Mm. Good point. <laughs> he was doing most of the verbalizing. Um, you know, I'm most famous for just going, nope, nope, I won't shake your hand. Uh, but, uh, I mean, I would say yes and no. I mean, we are good friends in the sense that we like each other, we get along, and there's no grief or, you know, enmity between us whatsoever. But we are not good friends in the sense that we don't spend time together and hang out together. But that's just, it's not because I wouldn't or right. that he wouldn't. It's because we just are different people. Like, you know, he's always been single. I've always been married. He lives in Vegas. I've lived other places. So it's, it's not that, you know, we avoid each other or wouldn't enjoy spending time together. Right. It's just, you know, the practical. I mean, you know, no one ever asked me you and Chris Moneymaker get along okay because they figure we do, but same thing. It's like he and I are friends and I know him a lot better because we used to hang out a lot when we were traveling the world, when we were both representing poker stars. But, uh, you know, nowadays again, you know, he's got his family in Memphis and I'm here in Raleigh and, you know, we're hours away from each other. And so unless we're both traveling to the same place, we don't have time to like be buds and hang out together. Right. But I mean, it's still an iconic moment when uh, you said, uh, thanks for busting me, Mike. Like it, it's, it's just, yeah, <laughs> there's, there's... I, I do remember that saying that and, you know, but I said my, there wasn't like there was constant verbal barrage back and forth every time we were at the table. Right. For the most part, there wasn't much being said. Um, and when there was, it was mostly him, but then of course he's talking nonstop to everybody. Yeah, no, he's unstoppable. One of the people that also never stops talking is Marcel Luz. Let's listen in a little bit and get a bit of a taste of uh, what the game was like back then and how much of a show he was making of it. Talk more, talk more. Murphy doesn't talk a lot, but he just keeps stacking a lot of chips. Oh, this, by the way, is not a hand that uh, I think Marcel is involved in. Um, John Murphy, however, 
sort of was touted as like, you know, the young gun, the, the, the superstar kid, 21 years old, um, overslept on the penultimate day of the main event yeah. and then got into a <laughs> got into a massive coin flip that could have made him a star. Like if he wins that coin flip against Matt Dean, he can be one of the chip leaders at the, at the final table. He loses that hand and we basically have never seen him again. Um, let's tie this into sort of online players and young players in general back in 04 during that time did you see a lot of those or what was someone like john murphy the big exception and you know have you ever heard of what happened to him because we haven't seen much of him i don't know if i would say he was the exception i mean but there were a lot less young guns in 04 than there were even the next two three four years after so where you really saw all the 21 year old kids 22 year old kids showing up was the next several years after this because right now in 03 and then this in 04 and then maybe the next year all those guys were still like you know in that 16 to 20 year old range waiting to grow up enough waiting to be legally eligible to come to vegas and then as soon as they could bam they showed up and a lot of them had showed up with tons of money in their pocket because they'd been winning big online yeah, and, and clearly, like, the um, tremendous amount of online satellites that was fueling the main event for quite a few years until the UIGEA happened really helped boost those numbers in a tremendous way while we see um, Shaffle against Dimitriou set over set, um, but it got, they got it all in pre, and uh, Shaffle gets eliminated even though he thought he hit the nine of hearts or the eight of hearts that are on the river, but it was the nine of hearts. Um, as far as pressure goes in a tournament like this, and you said you had a big stack the whole time, um, was it ever getting to a point where the adrenaline was sort of, you know, rising and rising and it, it making it tough to sort of stay calm or were you sort of locked in the whole time? You know, it's funny. I, I never really felt it in the moment. Um, you know, I'm fairly unemotional there when you I are. play poker. There you are. Hey, one of my first, uh, showings was this, oh, this is my, this is my first, I only took two bad beats this entire week. And this was the first of the two. Um, but I'm fairly unemotional playing poker. Um, much less emotional now than then even. But at the time, I was a lot less emotional than the average player in this event. Um, but I must have had something going on because I remember when we were posing for shots, you know, like you know, you're taking your pictures afterwards. And and there's a shot where they want me to, like, put my arms around like Matt Savage and, and uh and uh, Jim Miller, the associate tournament director, and and Matt makes a comment while he's smiling for the camera. And he's like, "Oh, nice of you to shower for us," referring to my kind of bo. And I was just like, "Whoo, yeah, man, that's like, you know, I wasn't noticeably sweating, but apparently there was something going on because I did have some really bad bo. Oh wow! Um, after winning that final table, even though I, as far as I know, never had a drop of sweat on me <laughs> the whole the whole day. Um, so you know the pheromones coming out or whatever it is. And uh, so there certainly was a lot of emotion, but it wasn't something that really had a big impact on me that controlled me or, you know, had an influence on my decisions. And that's just me being who I am, which is helpful when you play poker and maybe less helpful for other situations in life where people want to see more of you and get more out of you. Right. All right. We're back to the feature table here with, uh, the Marcel Lusk show. Let's let's listen on, on this hand. Marcel Lusk, ace four, couple of clubs. Where's the action? Yeah, I know. I'm thinking. Look at Marcel, Lon. I swear, he could eat a full slab of ribs and not get a spot of sauce on his shirt or tie. But I'm not sold on the hat. I don't know. 32,000 chips from Marcel. Murphy folds <laughs> over to Mario Zeladon, who was a dentist and card room manager in Costa Rica. In the morning, he gives you a root canal. In the afternoon, he'll check and raise you. <laughs> and Mario, with a king jack suited, is going to move all in with his 126,000 chips. It's so funny how they it's don't up to like, Marcel show us the now blinds to and stuff. Yeah, and, and positions, stack sizes, um, doesn't matter. It's just about the cards. I'm ready my mind. One of the things about Marcel that's so interesting is that he was so aggressive and also kind of playing to win, which maybe sounds a bit off, but playing to win was really a good strategy back then because people were just crumbling under the pressure in many, many spots. 
Yeah, they would tend to fold a lot, and then finally, like, a switch would flip, and now they just were, like, all of a sudden, now they'd get it in with some, you know, mediocre hand. Um, see, I don't know the exact chip counts in this scenario, but, like, when Zeladon shoved, was it enough chips that Marcel might fold? Right. You know, like, if Marcel had bet 20000 and now he's all in for 150000 I'm like, oh, that's a fine shove then, because there's a really good chance the guy will fold. And, uh, you know, you don't have to have the best hand with King Jack for this to be a good shove. But if it was obvious based on chip count that Marcel was never going to fold, then I, you know, like, why make that shove? Yeah, no, that's... And I don't know, because, uh, you know, the, the video doesn't do a good enough job of showing those things to us. Um you know, when you go look at that Tournament of Champions on the DVD, there's a hand where I call and Norm is saying, oh, my God, this is like a meltdown. Like, what a horrible call. And then it like, wait a second, you know, I'm getting three and a half to one on a, to call an all in pre flop heads up. Like, there's no two cards unfolding at that point, getting three and a half to one. Right. Oh, that's pretty far from a meltdown, you know. Yeah, no, definitely different times, too, as far as, you know, the evolution of poker commentary, the understanding that commentators developed about the game, as opposed to, you know, I, I, feel, like, I feel as though it's probably fair to say that the first maybe two years, 03, 04, poker was more like darts and bowling. And then all of a sudden it became, it became like a real game where strategy was being discussed. And, you know, even Lon and Norm got a better understanding of, of, of what was right and what was wrong. Well, even if you ask them, I'm sure they'd tell you that at the time they did not consider themselves like Lon was just like, he's here for the play by play for his voice. And he doesn't know anything about poker at the time. And Norm was hired as the poker expert. Like, here's someone we have, we've worked with before in other venues on ESPN for other types of events. And yet we've heard he plays poker. But then he'll tell you, like, well, I don't play no limit. I play stud eight or better that's his game if the world championship were stud eight or better then he would have been a great pick from day one yeah no that's that's a good point uh dj is saying in the chat the 04 main event is special to me because i just turned 21 and it was my first live event ever um he said he won 7500 on full tilt and put the rest towards the buy-in and had such an awesome time uh dj thanks like that's an awesome story great Th thanks for letting us know yeah. that, that, that's really cool um, and then Brian Young is asking, um, was Josh Arye really as arrogant as he was portrayed in the 04 main event the entire time? Or were those just tidbits that aired on TV? Well, let's just say, I don't think they had to, like, if they had been thinking, we're going to make this guy into the villain and make him look arrogant, they wouldn't have to like put a ton of effort into finding the footage. <laughs> he definitely considered himself by far the best player at the table at all points in time. And, uh, you know, and that's fine. There's nothing wrong with thinking you're good, but that doesn't mean you need to point it out to everyone else or say anything that puts them down. Right. Um, at the same time, and yet at the beginning of our show here, we saw him winning a huge pot where he knocked a guy out because he, you know, semi-bluffed a straight draw with one card to come and got there. And if he loses that hand... I think that would have taken a huge chunk of his stack and maybe he doesn't make the final table at all at that point. So we all got lucky along the way, one way or another. My luck mostly came in making strong hands and getting paid off and not getting bad beat after I made the hand. Right. And that's just as important, but it's a different kind of luck. And a lot of people ignore that because they're like, I had the best hand when 90% of the chips went in. How's that lucky that I won? Like you were lucky to find that spot. And you were lucky that the 10 or 20 percent chance of getting beat didn't happen. Yeah, no, it, it's 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 a different kind of luck, but it's definitely luck as well. Um, were there people because you've been in poker ever since? So were there people back then thinking back of it that were actually really good players, or do you feel? Sure. As, do you? Yeah, there, there were. Okay, so so explain that to me with what you know now. Like, what made someone a good player that you sort of played against in the 04 main event? Well, let's say that. I mean, there were always there always has been and always will be good players right because it's relative um if i can set up a home game you know with eight guys that are just god awful at poker but love to play and i'm mediocre then i'm i'm a good player in that game um no one in 04 
was like a great world-class player compared to the standards of today. Right. Cause we were all doing things wrong. I mean, I was ahead of the curve in the sense that like, Oh, my opening raise wasn't just always three X or more. A lot of my opening raises were like 2.7 X. And even now people might say, Oh, you don't need to raise that much. You can do a little, you can do smaller than that yet. And it's still smart. But back then, boy, I mean, if the blind was 1,000, 2,000 and you made it less than 6,000 as a raise, it was like, what is wrong with you? You don't know what you're doing. Um, so, but you know, obviously like, like we just saw Dan Harrington, you know, yeah. he was, you know, even in today's poker world, he would still be able to do at least okay. And for 04, he was one of the best in the world. Uh, Josh Arie played exceptionally well the entire tournament. So the fact that he had some arrogance, you know, and rub people the wrong way sometimes with his behavior doesn't mean that he wasn't also playing really well. He's, he's a field player. He's more of, you know, what do I think you have? When can I push you around? When can I not push you around? You know, that all the psychological stuff was even more of his strength than basic strategy, but he still was good at basic strategy. And he was one of the better players in the field at that psych, psychological manipulation of the opponent right and then also as we're seeing matthias anderson completely lose his mind and for some context for the people watching let's listen <laughs> let's listen to him every player no matter what the names are ah! but to win a tournament like this you can't uh, fear anyone ah! Ah! <coughs> i should not scream like this i have a cold <laughs> Well, he shouldn't scream like that with or without a cold, but he'll go his way, I'll go mine. Back to our feature table now, where the life of the party, as always, is Marcel Lusk. You win down. I had to leave you for a minute because I realized I needed to get something for later. Oh, I'm very excited about this. Um, I'm also I'm also curious, by the way, um, are, are the glasses within arm's reach? The glasses, I'm not sure. A similar pair, yes. So the original pair is still in your possession? Oh, yeah. I just, we sold our house a while ago because eventually we're going to be leaving the, uh, the North Carolina area at some point here. And uh, we knew it was going to take a while to sell our house. So we put it on the market. It sold. Now we're staying in there, staying longer than we thought. But we're just like renting this townhouse until we relocate. And uh, so it's just packed away somewhere <laughs> here. Maybe it might be somewhere in that bookcase behind me. I'm not sure. Um, but I know I have like a stash of them off to the side here because every now and then I sell a pair on my website. Oh, nice. Like I've offered them for sale since 04 at my website, but I don't, I've never sold that many. <laughs> but I still sell maybe one a year or two a year. And so I have a handful of oh, them over here i mean okay i'm now i'm very tempted i might be the purchases of this year i might i might do it bring it out for the home game um this this hand greg we, we just have to enjoy because this hand is one of my favorites and you can you, can you can see you can see a young man crumble at the table which is is always a funny thing to see david trung in the black shirt couple of kings another player from canada a lot of canadians here at the world series trung is staying in scott fishman's house here in las vegas during the series Brett Jungla tried that earlier. They weren't good roommates, so now Trung has the guest room. Marcel Lusk with ace jack unsuited. The bet is 32,000 from Trung to Marcel. Five ace. Three. Trung is going to see his kings raised. 70,000 more from Marcel. Over to Julian Gardner. He will fold. Gardner finished runner up in this main event in 2002. And Murphy will fold as well. Now the raise over to Trung. I raise. And Trung is going to come right back and re-raise Marcel. He'll make Marcel sweat a little bit. It's going to be 210,000 more to Marcel Lusk. Is the ace jack worth it? Yeah, the ace jack sort of shrinks in your mind when you have a 210,000 chip bet behind you. Oh, he's reaching. Nope, not gonna do it. Kings are good. 
Kings, yeah, Is King no good? Kings. You got Kings? You have Kings. Have Auntie, Queens. Please. Auntie, kings are good. Marcel's too good. I wouldn't even play marbles against him. I believe you have Kings. You don't believe I have King? No, I don't believe you have Ace King. You have Kings. Does he have X-ray vision? Amazing. I mean, back in those days, ranges were not as popular as they are now. So putting people on a specific hand was really sort of the thing to do. But, you know, imagine me and this kid and having, you know, Marcel Lewis, who's like, you know, cheerful, intimidating kind of personality, who's, you know, sort of playing aggressively, pointing it out seven yeah. times in a row that he had kings. Like, what, 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 what must, that, must that have been like? Well, I mean, it's not just that, um, <clears throat> I mean, you're right. People tended to put you on a hand. Right. And the saying back then was, you got to put a man on a hand. And, and they, you know, were unintentionally or not emphasizing the word a uh, hand, <laughs> but people still would put you on a range of hands. But there, I think it's just the guy forbet. And back then, if someone forbet, their range was just aces, kings, maybe ace king, maybe queens, you know, maybe a couple other hands every now and then. And so, oh, well, if I'm Marcel, it's like, well, I've got an ace. I'm not sure you'd even four bet with ace king. So you probably had two kings. If if Marcel had, had king queen or something, he'd have put him on two aces. Right. And but but basically what Marcel's doing is that he's creating a range, but the range is one hand because he thinks that the hands he could four bet with is the range is so small, and because he has a blocker yeah. for the ace, the only logical hand, there's two hands basically, kings and queens, right? Yeah, I mean, ranges were tight back then. If if someone, it, it was never 100% correct, but I believe it was the old, like, Tom McAvoy, TJ Cloutier tournament poker book that must have been written at least 25 or 30 years ago now. And they say that, like, oh, you know, if someone re-raises... That's probably like aces, kings, maybe ace, king, queens, you know, but if they four bet, that's basically aces and that's it. Right. And that statement was never completely true, but it was a lot more true then than it was than it ever would be again after the poker book. So in your mind, with what you knew back then, were you already looking for ways to exploit that? Or was it more so sure. what you mentioned before about getting big value because people were, were you know, never fo never folding enough? Well, it, it was a question of categorizing the player. Um, some players were going to be very, very loose, but they're not three betting and four betting loose. They weren't loose aggressive. They were loose passive. So they would be, you know, they might call your three bet with much too wide of a range, but they weren't going to four bet even if they thought you were three betting light. And you would also have to figure out like, is this person going to call off the first, you know, 10, 20% of their stack, but then a lot of them would get super tight for the rest of it. So you might get this guy to put in enough chips that now a pot size bet is essentially his remaining stack. And now they would fold almost everything but the nuts. Right. So you could try to take advantage of that. Like I'm going to build a pot enough to the point where if I just make a bet to put you all in, it actually is a reasonable size. And then I know you're going to fold unless you happen to have made basically the nuts on the board. Well, we're getting some great advice here already from Greg on this show. We are watching the 2004 WSOP main event. And you guys can maybe pick up a few things from Greg because this guy's been around forever and, you know, is still well, hanging. Careful. Well, that advice today won't work so well. <laughs> no, but it's but the context of knowing that stuff is is is, yeah. all, is all part of the foundation of how you learn to think in ranges and get away from the thinking of putting people on specific hands or, you know. Play, yeah. playing hands the wrong I just way. Mean, and nowadays, if a player puts a third of their chips in, they're a lot less likely to fold for the rest. <laughs> That's true. That's very true. <laughs> All right. Let, let's, let, let, let's listen in on the end of this hand between Marcel and Harry Dimitriou, which is uh, quite entertaining. Marcel looks like he's going to act. I don't trust him. <laughs> <laughs> hey, look in the mirror, pal. You don't trust him. <laughs> well, Harry's going to come back, it looks like. So Harry Dimitriou puts out 225,000. Sorry, what did you say? This is more of an old school bet here. Like, you got queens on this board. 
you know, and you've already had this action on the flop, it's like, this is a great spot to check back and do a river bluff, you know, but people didn't understand those concepts back then for the most part. Give a little bit, <laughs> give a little bit of your chips to me. When Marcel stands up and goes acapella, he's convinced his read on this hand is correct, that his kings are best. And now the river card is a nine, and once again, Marcel's read was perfect. The check mark shows he's got the hand one if he doesn't fold. Just in case I'm scared, he's not going to bet it. I bet a little bit. Well, even a little bit will be almost the remaining chips for Marcel, no matter how much he chooses. I bet 100,000. I'm sure he calculated that with Keynesian and Malthusian theory. Now to Harry. Oh, they're showing pot size. And he makes I the call. King. And loses the hand. King. King. Yes, sir. Queen. Ah. How did I know? Om. 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 I made them, uh, give it to me, don't give it to everybody. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I mean, this is probably the perfect time to ask you about how the table dynamics and personalities have changed or adjusted over time. The, because the, the Marcel Lusk and Matthias Anderson type characters, we don't see that often anymore. They're still there every, yeah. every so often, but they're mostly gone because the game has become so much more intense. Um, how have you sort of seen and noticed that evolution, and how do you feel about the fact that we don't see this anymore? You know, it's a love-hate thing. I mean, it's the kind of thing like what Marcel's doing there, unless you are Harry that hand, <laughs> you're enjoying it. Right. And even Harry has to be like, oh, none of this is mean. He's not like, oh, you idiot, why did you do this? He's only celebrating his own victory. He's not celebrating Harry's loss. And it really couldn't be interpreted as him celebrating your loss. You know, and when Matthias goes crazy after winning the hand, again, you know, it's like, eh, you know, this is kind of amusing. And But it's the people, you know, who go too far, like the William Kasuf thing. Right. You know, the issue isn't with what he was saying from my point of view. You know, you know, I'm not like, oh, this guy's saying stuff he shouldn't be saying. To me, the issue is that he was wasting time. You know, the players at his table throughout that tournament where he first got his notoriety were like, he's doing this every hand, every decision. We're getting in half as many hands as any other table because of this guy. So, you know, Marcel there celebrating and stuff, or even during the hand singing, it's like, he, okay, he wasted five seconds, maybe. And if he wasn't at the feature table, the dealer wouldn't have waited for him to finish singing to put out the next card. They only waited because they had the thing in their ear telling them to wait. So I have no problem with that stuff, and it makes it more fun. Right. Do you think that still can happen in poker, or is the game too tough now to where you know, you're giving away stuff, whether it's energy or whether it's tells, uh, we just don't see it anymore. Yeah, I don't, I think it's fine. It's up to you though. I mean, I right. don't think someone who doesn't naturally do that should try to go out of their way to make it happen. But if that's who you are, then I think you do it and it just makes it more fun for you. And it doesn't necessarily take away from your game whatsoever. Now, I mean, if he only was singing like that, you know, the way uh, Norm said, like, oh, you know, when he's doing acapella, that means he thinks he has the best hand. Maybe that's true. Maybe he is more vocal, more verbal, more active when he's confident that he's going to win the pot. And if that's the case, then he's giving off a big tell. But if he's doing that just as often when he's weak as when he's strong and so on, then no problem. Right. Well, I hope that we get another one of these either singing characters at some point or maybe some more Marcel Lusk action deep in the main event in future years. Um, shout out to everyone in the, in the chat. They all love seeing Marcel's antics. They all miss him at the table. And of course, seeing this yeah. footage again now is very exciting. For the people who have never watched the 2004 main event or any main event for that matter, we are releasing all of them on Poker Go. In the summer here, as we are all waking up 
in sweat because there's no WSOP happening, you can go to pokergo.com and watch the World Series of Poker from the past. The 03 main event was released last week. This week, we're doing 04, and tomorrow is Final Table Friday. We are releasing the final table that, of course, Greg dominated. And then we're going to roll into 2005 on the weekend with some preliminary events and then into the main event. And then next week, you guessed it, Joe Hashem is my guest here on the show to talk about the 05 main event. Uh, by the way, if you are watching and if you're in the chat, let us know where you're watching from. Don't forget to like this video, subscribe to the channel, do all that good stuff that helps us out. And I always already see um, Christine from Louisiana watching. I see Scott from New Hampshire. Um, I see lots of people here joining us in the chat, and we really appreciate all you guys reaching out for us as we are going through this day. If you, if you pause this video, I'll make a bet on who wins. All right, I'll bet go. you who wins the pot. Okay, go for it. <laughs> well, see, this is an easy one because even though anything might happen, Al Crux is the one all in, and we know he makes the final table. So, so yeah, that, easy, easy peasy. You know he's going to spike a ten or a straight or whatever. Well, that's I a, don't remember how he won. Right. I mean, we can listen in on it because it's pretty special. dramatic. And is it diamond, Crux diamond, is going to need a ten eventually. Or else he's going to be jack. I'm not and sure. a turn card, and that oh, throws no, more dirt be a 10. on Crux. So this guy, Al Crux, makes the final table. He has five percent on the turn. That's poker, guys. Like, ladies yeah. and gentlemen, that's how the game works. And sometimes you're on the right side, and sometimes you're heading out the door. This is grave. He's down to one card and one card only. It has to be a ten. Here comes the river. Oh, the ten. Oh my God. Al seems to be in shock. Woo! Al Crux gets the miracle 10 and wins the hand. And Hilger takes I mean, that is also something that when you rewatch this stuff, you notice that certain players in certain spots got incredibly lucky or incredibly unlucky. Yeah. And we'll get to it on the final table bubble, but, you know, if Marcel Lusk's hand hold up or if David Williams busts on a coin flip against Josh Arie, you know, the whole, the whole history of the game is so much different. Um, is there one moment that you have in your mind that, um, you know, was your get out of jail free card, so to say? Um, not really. I mean, I got a couple of lucky rivers, but in each case it was like the money went in and then I took a bad beat on the flop for the turn and then the river saved me. <laughs> so it was more of a like, hey, the best hand won. It just won dramatically rather than holding up from the get-go and i only gave two bad beats the entire week i only took two i only gave two which is both of those are amazing numbers for a week of poker and both those bad beats i gave were at the final table both of them it was you know knocking out it was matthias and uh you know it was one of them and it was like okay i'm i have them all in pre-flop and they're the favorite you know, significant favorites, three to one, four to one favorites, uh, him and Mike McLean. But also in both cases, it was like no more than 10% of my chips. Right. So it's not like if I didn't get lucky, it was necessarily going to have this massive effect on my chances. It was going to matter, but it wasn't going to be critical. Right. Yeah. I mean, I mean the, the, only the people that have the purest week of poker will ever win the main event. And obviously, even the guy who finished second got unlucky at some point. And, you know, that that's just the crazy yeah. part is that you can be the last two standing and still feel as though you, you know, didn't didn't make it all the way through. Um, this is a very, very obvious question that you probably got a million times. But how did winning this tournament change your life? And looking back on it now, you know, what is it like seeing this? Because obviously, you know, this was, you know, the, the biggest few days of your life. And, and it, it affected how every year following that sort of played out. Yeah, it is. It's, it's a huge thing. Um, I was a full-time patent lawyer. I was working for Pfizer at the time. So I'm in-house, you know, I'm a, you know, it's a nine to five kind of job. It's not like being a trial attorney. It's not like being even a non-trial lawyer at a law firm where you might have to put in ridiculously long hours you know, for Pfizer, it's like, no, you, you put in your, basically your nine to five and for the most part, that's it. Um, and now all of a sudden I'm quitting that job and I'm traveling the world playing poker all the time. And, you know, then later start getting into teaching. Um, I was one of the first instructors for the WSOP Academy. And then I teach under my own banner for the last 10 years or so. Um, 
And so everything's full-time poker. The funny thing is I might've cost myself a lot of money by winning the main event. Oh. I was actually about to leave Pfizer and take this other job for this smaller company in Tucson that needed someone like me. I had a background in both biotechnology and chemistry and they needed a patent attorney like that. Most of their inventions had been more mechanical. They made these machines that automated blood analysis. So these things like, oh, you know, we're taking samples, you know, tissue samples, blood samples. We're going to analyze them under the microscope to see if you have cancer cells in there or something, and we're staining them. And so you used to have these technicians that are sitting there doing all this preparation work, and they made machines that automated the process. And all their original inventions were just the mechanics and the software and stuff of this machine. And now they're like, ooh, now that we have this machine that does these cool things, we can like do different types of testing that wasn't really feasible when it was done by hand. And we're inventing stuff that's biotech, that's chemical. So I'm about to get this job and I don't know if they would have done it or not, but a lot of these companies, they'll do matching of your uh, stock options. And I had lots of options at Pfizer that weren't worth anything, but I still had lots of them. And if they had matched all those, this company went gangbusters later. <laughs> <laughs> so my stock options, if they had given them to me, might have been worth way more than the $5 million. And I've never looked at their actual stock number. I don't want to know their prices because I didn't want to know. <laughs> oh, my God. So, so, But it's just funny that like, oh, my God, you hit the lottery, basically win five million. And then it's like, oh, wait, but I would have made 25 million if I'd taken that job with that company. Wow. In stock options. So you would you know, and I don't know. I don't know what the number would have been. But you so you would have been very rich, but you would not have been famous. And now you got fame, which, you know, can be a burden. But I think it can also help and enrich your life in, in a certain kind of way. I mean, you're, you're making a bit of a benefits. I don't, I don't advise to anyone that you try to become famous for the sake of fame. Okay. I don't think fame has any inherent value. It's just an issue of, you know, can you monetize it to be honest? You know, so if I was famous for something that people didn't like me, right. right. Like, Oh, there's that jerk. You know, we all know who he, he is, you know, what a, what a, what a, you know, not sure how far I can go without getting you in trouble. There, there's no trouble, no, no trouble here. We can say whatever we you want. You know, but you know, someone's like, "Oh, look at that, that that asshole that we saw on TV or whatever." That kind of thing. It's like I wouldn't want to be famous for that because you can't make any money with that fame. Right. Um, so the fact that I'm famous, or even if a small minority of people thought, "Oh, I, I actually love that guy. I think he's great for that thing he did," um, I wouldn't recommend that to anyone. Being famous, I don't think really, you know, I don't need the ego stroking of it or any of that stuff. Do, do you feel as though in any sort of way, whether it's small or big, winning $5 million and winning the main event changed you? I don't think so. Um, you know, obviously, like, let's say David Williams wins. It might have changed him. I'm not saying it would have. I'm right. not saying anything negative about him at all but you know he was young he was barely old enough to play i don't remember if he was 22 or but he was not over 21 by a lot and that means he's still a young guy and so it might have had a huge impact on him um you know a lot more so than finishing second did but you know i was already like 40 years old so you know how much is my basic personality really going to change at that point almost no matter what happens to me um, so I don't think it had a big effect. Um, certainly, you know, people were like, oh, what was your big splurge? You know, you must have gone and bought, you know, a fancy sports car or this or that. And I'm just like, yeah, like, I don't have an answer to that question. Because but then what I started doing is I started like, oh, well, you know, I my wife pointed out that since the bracelet is platinum and my wedding ring is yellow gold, I need a two tone watch. So instead of like my hundred dollar Seiko gold tone watch, it was like, you need a watch that's like, you know, got like the gold and the silver colorations to it. And I was at the WPT event in Paris that summer of 04 and I had busted out and we were doing family stuff. My wife and daughter were with me. So we were just being tourists and it's like, oh, here's this watch store with like big signs saying sale going on. We go in there and we bought this watch and I forget even can't remember the name of the brand, but it's like a French brand, but it's not, you know, it's not like the French equivalent of Rolex or whatever, you know, 
it's a perfectly nice watch and it was two tone. It cost $80, <laughs> but I would answer the report like, well, I did buy this watch, you know, because my wife said I needed a two tone watch and they'd be like, Oh yeah, that's nice. How much do you mind if I ask how much? And I'd say 80 and they'd go, yeah, I could see spending 80,000 for that. It's really, I'm like, okay, well, you want to, you want to, you interested in buying this? I could use some cash, you know, we'll go cheap. You, you like it for 80,000. I'll sell it to you for 800, you know? <laughs> be like no when i say 80 i meant eight zero eighty dollars that that's really and, that's uh, really funny um you know and they would just jump in i'm just like why would you think this thing looks like it's worth eighty thousand? right i personally i'm like how do i look at any watch and think it's worth eighty thousand unless i'm an expert and i know exactly what that watch is right do you feel as though winning the main event at age 40 helped slash prevented you from um making a lot of bad decisions if you had been 21, for instance, and then to tie that into the next question, um, what, was it easy or doable to survive as a poker player predominantly as the game got tougher and tougher? Or did you also have to, you know, take a step back at one point, realizing that, you know, spending money, money on big buy-ins wasn't the way forward? Well, I mean, certainly it was, it was easy for quite a while to just keep playing because, you know, while I represented poker stars, the contract would say, if it's a televised event, we'll pay the buy-in. So it's like, who cares what it is? You know, if it's the 50K, you know, it wasn't yet called that, but the 50K Players Championship, you know, any of those things. Um, and you could definitely make a living playing tournament poker back then, you know, if you were good enough, because the fields were so soft. You know, again, there were some huge pots I won in this tournament where my opponent was someone whose reputation was this is a really good player and yet you know we would look at it today and say man they just donked those chips off like that was horrible the way they played the hand and yet like oh this is considered like a good player at the time um so it was just you know very different than it is today Today, if you make a play where most good players would say you donked it off, well, if you do that more than once a week or something, then you're not good enough. And it was happening all the time back then. So then as far as your own sort of evolution throughout the game as a, as a player, Ooh, yay. Got, there. Got, got the king on the turn here. <laughs> Man, what, what what if it what if it doesn't come as we're rewatching it, huh? What 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 happens then? Alternate reality, butterfly effect. Um, yeah. <laughs> but no, uh, what what I'm wondering, was there a point in time where you realized like, hey, I am maybe no longer at the top, or maybe I am no longer among the best because of how the game evolved, or you know, is that just too hard to notice while you're in the moment? Well, I don't consider myself to have ever been the best. Or anything i consider myself in the top few percentage right and of course you know if you're in the top three or four percent that's fantastic but that still leaves potentially thousands of people ahead of you and uh you know it's funny i, I used to uh after this i would play a lot of, I, I prefer mixed games more so than than no limit hold'em so one of the cash games I used to play a lot when I would be traveling and be in Vegas and LA and stuff would be like some of those big mix games, like 400, 800, you know, 300, 600 mix. And every time I played in one of those games, I basically never said to myself like, oh, I'm the best Omaha eight player at this table, or I'm the best triple draw player at this table. It would be here's seven or eight of us. And I would consider myself, oh, I'm probably the second or third best triple draw player. And I'm probably the second or third or best Omaha and the second or third best Hold'em and so on. So I would always think that I'm like, I'm one of the better players in each game and none of them are huge weaknesses for me. And that's how I was a big favorite overall in those games is by I was nowhere near the worst at any of them. Right. And so even now when it comes to tournament poker and stuff, I don't sit there and think I'm better than anyone else. Um, but I know I'm, I know how to play tournament poker better than most of the field and pretty, you know, I'd have to go to one of the super high rollers before I wouldn't feel like that's going to be the case. Yeah. And those fields are stacked with players that are under 30 and they're GTO machines and studying in all sorts of different ways. Um, as far as the way you approach the game right now, do you still 
study? Do you still have time to work on your game? And you know, do you still enjoy traveling the circuit and playing live events? Oh, I love playing live events. I mean, that's really what I enjoy the most. Um, and I love tournament poker the most. You know, cash games are great if they are draw games or stud games. I'm not a big fan of, uh, you know, flop games for cash games. You know, like PLO is better than No Limit Hold'em, but I would still much rather play the draw games and the stud games if they, but they're just not available in most of the world. Um, I almost got there. <laughs> this almost is... got there on the turn here. Aria is so, de um, Aria is so dejected, by the way, that he made no money off of his quads at all, which is funny. Yeah. I'm surprised I checked back the flop because generally I don't. If I raise pre-flop and I only get one collar, I pretty much always see bet. And I wonder why I didn't that time. You know, if I thought I, if I saw something and I, because I just don't remember I don't remember well enough to say exactly what was happening in that hand, but normally it's like a hundred percent C bet against one player. <laughs> yeah, that was the C bet was definitely a lot more popular back in the day, and it was big too compared to what they do now. As the GTO guys are betting like a quarter of the pot or or whatever um, whatever small sizing they're picking. Um, people in the chat, by the way, lots of responses to my question of where everyone's watching from. I see Michigan, I see Connecticut, Foxwoods, uh, Las Vegas, uh, Canada, Ontario, um, and tons more places. I can't name them all, obviously. But uh, yeah, if you do have questions for Greg, do let me know. I'd love to you know work some in there if they uh, fit in there. And this, by the way, we're watching right now is the guys at the table discussing John Murphy oversleeping and uh, you know showing up uh, maybe five or six orbits after the tournament had already kicked off. Um, this tournament was being played at Binion's, and the year, yes. af the year after, it moved to the Rio, and then they brought back the final three tables to Binion's, and then in, from 06 onwards, it was all at the Rio. Um, could you could you paint the picture for the audience, which I, I'm i going to assume has largely never played at Binion's or you know tasted some of the atmosphere? How different was it from <laughs> going from there to the Rio and, you know, how, how are those memories now of, of that, that place? Oh, I mean, I, I still love Binion's, but, you know, if you go there now and you're thinking, oh, it's a little seedy, it's a little run down or, you know, whatever, like, hey, this place has seen better days, you know, <laughs> holes in the wall, whatever else you might find. You know, it wasn't like it was way better back then. It was, you know, they were worried about bankruptcy. In fact, uh, we saw a player earlier in the show, Julian Gardner, who finished runner-up to Varconi. And I think his prize was an even million dollars. There was such concern about, you know, bankruptcy and stuff of Binion's being run under uh, um, um, the, the sister. I, I'm, I'm blanking on her name. Was it Becky uh, Bainan? Becky, yeah. Becky Binion Bainan. That uh, when he instead of like taking a check or something to fly home to England, they took cash because they didn't want to like go home with a check and have it bounce or something. They were worried about not getting the money if they didn't just take the cash now while they could. So he and his dad literally like took the million in cash, hired security to like walk them across the street to their hotel room at the golden nugget. And then some kind of security to the airport, you know, and then literally it's just, here's my carry on luggage a duffel bag full of a million dollars cash. <laughs> that is incredible. And I've heard this story as well in the past. And Julian Gardner booked an extra seat for his duffel bag with a million dollars in it. Oh, did he? He did, yeah. I didn't know that. I didn't know that bit. Yeah, so that's, a, awesome. that's, a, that's an amazing story. Uh, this is also kind of funny, and it ties into um, what made you iconic, which were the glasses. So let's listen in on this uh, moment between you and Matthias. In another man's hands. Nah, they don't work on him. <laughs> Those things need to be outlawed. What do you mean? After this, everyone, when this hits the TV, everyone's going to be wearing them. I keep them for one hand. One hand? Yeah, one hand. <laughs> now watch, I'm going to get in a monster pot with you, and you're going to be able to see my eyes. You are Dan. It's not even. a good thing, is it? No. You might, you might see something. I don't want you to see well, anything. Uh, I didn't mean to, to mention this, but uh, it, it, just to be fair to you, you know when you change the, the tilt of the glasses, the, 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 re, the reflection changes. So I think you're bluffing in a certain position. When the other position, you have a hand when it's solid. Yeah, I, I, I thought it was only fair. Oh, I know. I, in doing your betting, I thought it was only fair I mentioned that to you. 
I know it changed color. I didn't realize it was a tell, though. Poker is more than just a card game. It's a mind game. Yeah, I'm 100% sure that that was total bullshit by Dan, that he made that up, just, like, put a little uncertainty in me. Right. But it is true, like, depending upon the exact angle with the lighting, those can be kind of golden or green or orange. And so he's right that, like, if I'm here, you know, they're one color. And if I move just a little bit, now they could change completely to the different color. I doubt he saw a pattern <laughs> that like, oh, green is when he's bluffing and orange, he has it. So I suspect he was saying that more to like, like oh, maybe I'll put some uncertainty in this guy, throw him off his game, or maybe he'll stop wearing them. 100%. He believes me. Do you take those new glasses so I can see what's cooking? I get guys on tilt by consistently needling them. You want to know where the last guy that kept raising my big line is? He's watching somewhere. I listen first. You know I've got to see if the players are weak or strong. And the question is, do you know what I've got to? And wiped them out. Nice playing with you. When I'm wearing those glasses, it's just too annoying to stare me down. I look at his eyes and I'm confused. If it adds any significant edge, and it's fun. Why not do it? You sure you don't want to call? It's a mind game. Sometimes. It's so, so let me ask you, Greg. Um, how did you decide to wear the glasses? And was this the first appearance of the glasses, or was this something you had been doing prior to this? So we discussed my first main event was in 2002. Yeah. And and I used to not wear glasses or anything at all. And I'm with my family at Disney World about a month before that main event, and because my wife and daughter always want to go to the gift shops. That means I'm in the gift shops. And as we finish with the tower of terror ride <laughs> at uh, Disney studios, um, they're in the gift shop. And I see this rack of these glasses that have like the eyes, like the ones I bought. Others have like a little pictures of skulls in each eye or other things. And I just thought like, Oh, these are funny. It would be funny to, put this on in the middle of a big pot and when i did the guy kind of freaked out so then i just started putting them back on every time i was playing a hand so then ever since it, it stayed sort of a thing but i i don't see you wearing them all the time do no. you do you still break them out or is it done now not really i mean the problem is they're dark sunglasses and then they have this sticker that creates the hologram and my eyesight just isn't good enough. I'm going to misread the board unless it's a really bright table. And so if I want to cover my eyes now, I use the blue shark optics because now I can still see when I wear those. Those are made for poker. They don't inhibit your eyesight. If I were to pull out these little glasses, if I'm not at the feature table with all that bright light, then no, it's like I'm going to, you know, the dealer is going to put a six on the river and I'm going to think it's a, a seven. Yeah, that's 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 not worth the uh, potential yeah. gain you get from having the uh, intense stare down. But it did it did become part of your personality and your persona. Fossil man, you had the fossils yeah. and you had the holog holographic glasses. Um, the whole thing sort of came together. Where did that whole thing come from? And and how did you sort of land on handing out fossils? And I know you tell this on the episode and I've heard it before, but I think many people are probably still wondering, like, how did he come up with this whole idea of the fossils? Yeah, I, before I went to work for Pfizer, I was a patent attorney at a law firm in San Diego County. And I used to play, you know, in the poker rooms there in Southern California. And my wife grew up rock hounding. So she and her family would go out and find mineral samples and stuff, you know, weekend trips. And uh, there was a rock and mineral show in San Diego that she wanted to go to. And when we were there, I found a fossil very much uh, like the one you see me using here in the show, this long black kind of teardrop shaped piece of rock. And so I just had that. And people in the poker room in, in Oceanside, California that night were like, what is that? What is that? And I'm telling them it's a fossil and it's 300 million years old. And they were like, man, that must be worth a fortune. And it's like, oh, those are actually not very expensive. So I bought more of them and I sold them to people at the poker room. And so it was just a way to uh, make a little extra money. I had this deal my wife kind of put on me back then. Um, you know, I was playing low limit games originally, like three, six limit hold'em was the you know main game, just like one, two, no limits, kind of the main game most places now. And so even though this is a small game and I'm winning, 
at that point in time, she didn't understand yet. You could be a long-term winning player. So she uh, had me make a deal that like I would take a thousand dollars as in my poker bankroll. And if I lost that money, I promised to quit playing forever. And so here I am playing three, six limit, maybe trying to grind out an average 40, $50 per session win. If I can buy these fossils and sell it and make 10, 15 bucks extra selling a fossil, that's adding 20% more to my win rate. <laughs> so literally that's what I was doing is I always just had several fossils on the table. When people would ask me, I'd tell them what it is and usually sell about one fossil per visit to the poker room. And, uh, then the nickname came quite organically from that. No, that's awesome. I love that story. And the, the fossil collection, is it, is it still intact? Do you still, do you still bring fossils to the table? So every tournament, what I've been doing now for quite a while, over 10 years, uh, I don't remember exactly when I started now, but 10 to 15 years ago, almost not 15, but definitely over 10 years ago, um, kind of inspired by Barry uh, selling his Ace on the River book. Um, I thought, oh, you know, I could do the same thing with the fossil. So I had a bunch of fossils anyways, because every time I would do one of my seminars, I would give everyone an autographed fossil. All the students would get one of those as kind of a little memento. And so I started coming with a different fossil for every tournament. Because um, like after I won this main event, that fossil has stayed you know like on the display case you know the trophy case it doesn't travel with me um but you know i had been using just the next fossil continuously but then i switched to a different one so now here's this new fossil and it's like oh remco you knocked me out of this tournament now i'm signing it you know to remco rinkama congrats you got me sign it the name of the event the date and here's your you know souvenir for busting me and if i were to win the tournament so like all those hpt titles you know any real tournament that i win then i keep the fossil and i sign it to myself you know like hey this is the winning fossil and i sign it and put the event and the date and so then that goes on the trophy case with the main event fossil i that, that's cool it's just cool to have that sort of thing because poker fans no matter buying big or small We'll probably get a kick out of something like that. While we see Matthias Anderson completely lose his mind, which would <laughs> which would blow everyone's ears off. But let's listen in a little bit here. And the turn card, a queen of hearts. And now a seven and seven only on the river would knock out Matthias Anderson. And now the oh, river card. The seven hearts. It's an eight, and Anderson wins the hand. Da! 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 I don't know if Josh appreciates Matthias's end zone da! dance. Is that yes in Swedish? I think Greg Raymer's glasses just broke. <laughs> I love it. I like Matthias Anderson, you know, haven't heard much from him since. I think he played some events, but his iconic scream will just forever live on in the history books uh, as it pertains to this event. Um, but I, I mean, we've talked about this before, but people are still asking, do you have the original glasses? Do you still have them? Yeah. So oh, yeah. They're, they're still intact? Yeah, I mean, when I packed up the trophy case, you know, before we moved here, then, you know, so they're still packed up with that fossil and, and other stuff like that. But yeah, I definitely have that exact pair. And then I have a pair that I had been wearing ever since when I, whenever I wore them and that pair broke, it just needs a little repair work, but, uh, you know, it didn't like snap. It's like the screw came out from the, you know, the earpiece, but, uh, um, you know, I, like I said, I don't wear those anymore at right. the table, so I haven't bothered to get it fixed. Um, I mean, I do want to give a yeah. I want to give a quick shout out here, by the way, because you told me that you still sell the glasses, and you didn't tell me to ask to promote it, but I just want to mention this to people: fossilmanpoker.com. Go to the store and buy yourself a pair of Greg Raymer glasses. If you buy them, I'm gonna <laughs> I'm gonna give them a break though. Like, my price is like twenty bucks plus shipping or something. If you go on ebay you're going to get a much better price okay and it's not like they're signed because there's no ways to sign them you know like they're like little wireframe things and stuff but if they come to the website to buy a fossil now that's unique you can't get it anywhere else and it's autographed so they might prefer that over the pair of glasses and 
I'm I'm almost out of the glasses. Oh wow! So I mean, if you want, I got thousands of fossils, but I'm not sure how many glasses I have left. If you guys, if you guys want to take a look at the the fossilman store, I think it's really cool to see that um, you're 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 staying true to to the fossil man character, and I think it's really funny to see that you know this lives on, and it, it's cool. It's a part of poker history, and I think it's really cool. And I, I hope to one day knock you out because then I can get a signed fossil. And you know when when the player really enjoys it and appreciates it, it takes a lot of the sting out of you know getting eliminated. Um, and most players do. I've even had you know guys who play super high stakes, and will say, "Oh, you know, I love that fossil I got when I busted Greg in that you know bracelet tournament five years ago, or any of that kind of stuff." You know, and and it feels good um, that they. I'm glad they enjoy it. And there's only just been a handful of people who are kind of like, you know, like, oh, what, what's the, why are you giving me a rock, you know, attitude, you know, and I'm like, okay, if you don't want it, that's fine. Just tell me, I'm not going to be offended. Or like, uh, I'm trying to remember who it was, uh, who basically, you know, someone asked about it when he was at the table and, oh, it was Jawanda, who's kind of a germaphobe. And he's like, Ooh, why would you want a rock? It's been in the dirt. Like, you know, so it wasn't like, <laughs> Oh, cause it's, yeah, it had nothing to do with me. It was like, this is a rock. Why would you want this dirty rock? And of course that rock, you know, it's been <laughs> polished and, you know, cut and polished and da da da. It's not any dirtier than like a chip rack or anything else. You're probably not, it's probably less dirty than pretty much everything else on the poker table. Yeah, and, and um, but I just said to him, like, look at if you knock me out and don't want it, just say no thanks. I won't be offended. Um, and he did knock me out, like in the next year, and I remembered, and I was like, you don't want this, do you? Like <laughs> a year ago, you were, you know, and he's like, yeah, no. He goes, I wouldn't really. I don't even want to touch it. That's so. Like, it wasn't personal to me. It'd have been the same if you or anyone else wanted to give it to him. Right. Yeah, that's kind of funny. Uh, for the people who are asking, it is it is fossilmanpoker.com. If you just search for Greg Raymer website, you'll you'll find it as well. That's how you can find the store. I hope, Greg, that you're texting me tomorrow saying I sold 30 fossils. That would be hilarious and and really funny. Um, and <laughs> That'd be, that would be a record yeah, by far. Yeah, there you go. Um, for the people who are watching, please keep sending in your questions and remarks about this show. We are watching the 2004 main event. We are going all the way down to the final table tonight so you're not going to have to miss any of the action from that day and then tomorrow morning at 9 a.m pacific that's when the final table of the 04 main event becomes available on poker go and along the lines of what we have available i just want to mention as well that the plo poker masters online series starts on monday with live streaming for a week straight High stakes action with Jeff Platt and Joey Ingram doing the commentary. That'll be available for free on Poker Go and on the Poker Go Facebook channel. And then I am going to continue to do this show twice a week, Tuesday and Thursday. Don't forget to like this video, by the way. It's very important. I hate asking for it, but it is very important. And subscribe to the channel. Uh, that would mean a lot to me. It helps support the show. Um, lots of people um, referencing the HPT and, and, you know, do you remember playing here and there? There's probably a bit too many of those to really dive too deep into. One of the questions that I do find interesting, and I think this is a question that everybody always loves hearing the answer to, is what is the highest stakes you've ever played and what's the biggest pot you've ever won? And, you know, that seems to be like the ultimate fan question, but I just, I just have to pose it to you. Uh, in terms of cash game, uh, the highest stakes would probably be I played, and you know, I've played some of these bigger mixed games quite a bit, like 200, 400, 400, 800. Um, you know, and those are limit games, of course, not, those, it's not, 400, 800 blinds, big bet. Um, biggest one, though, would be the, the one of those limit games we are playing 800, 1600. So that means, you know, just in a very average pot is going to have 10, 20,000 or more in it. And there was tons of action for the most part in these games. Um, you know, something about limit poker, it really, it has, it has more action by far than, than no limit and pot limit, because it's always just, you know, like one more blind, two more blinds, you know, and it keeps people in. And there's a lot of the strategy in those games is like, oh, I'm check raising to try to knock you out. You know, he's going to bet, I'm going to check raise, that's going to get rid of you, which will promote my chances of winning this pot or winning half this pot. But then you know that maybe that's what I'm doing. And so now you don't want to fold 
and the other guy's three betting for the same reason to knock people out or he just wants to build the pot because he's so sure he has the best hand and so all of a sudden now you're putting tons of money in you know with sometimes kind of marginal hands yeah no definitely and then because that was the biggest game you ever played of course the biggest pot would only be you know 10 12 maybe 15 bets so you know as far as posing that question to a no limit player that is a bit different than uh, posing yeah. it to someone who plays well, big big mix games my biggest pot that i ever won was in no limit hold'em oh i was i was at bellagio back in maybe 05 or so and i was on the list like next up for one of these mix games and so i had a whole bunch of chips with me, like 50,000 in Bellagio chips or something on me. And the games back then still didn't really have caps. So if it was a no limit or pot limit game, they very rarely had a maximum that you could, you know, you could buy in for as much as you wanted. And so I'm waiting for that game and I'm like, oh, well, you know, here's this like 2550 no limit game. I'll sit here because there's empty seats play this while I'm waiting and I plop down like 25,000 or something. And when I sat down, no one at the table even had 5,000. And the first hand that I played on the big blind and someone raised and we all folded and the second hand on the small blind and someone raised and we all folded. And, and at that point I'm noticing, Oh, this guy next to me has added like, um, another like 25 or 30,000, like he'd grab some 5k Bellagio chips and he had added them and they were right out front. He wasn't doing anything sneaky, but he had added to his stack. And I'm like, Oh, that's important to notice. Like instead of 4,000, he's got like 29,000. And now I start like the next hand, it folds to my blind, my button. And I'm like, well, this seems like a tight game. I guess I might as well try to steal the blind. So I like raise to 125. And he's staring at the big blind on his left. He keeps looking over there. like He's worried about that guy and he calls and then that guy calls. And so I'm like, Oh, well that sucks. You know, all I've seen is fold, fold, fold. Now they both call and the flop comes nine, seven, three. I got bottom pair. So they both check. Well, I'll see bet this. I got a pair, you know, and I bet. And now this kid again is like staring at the big blind on his left. He seems way worried. Like, why are you so worried about this guy? Like, as far as you know, he's not, he might be done with it, you know, and you're, you know, and he calls and he seemed very relieved when that guy folded. And I'm like, well, I'm done with the hand, you know, he, he should have better than this or he should have a draw, you know, a good draw, like eight ten or something. So I, I'm, I'm done with the hand for the most part. Oh, wait, the turn's a jack. Now I have top and bottom pair. So now he checks, I bet. Now he puts in a check raise. I'm like, something doesn't feel right. I just doesn't feel like he really has anything. I, so I take my time and I'm going to just call and I'm calling slow because if he's bluffing, I want him to bluff again. And I'm just, my plan is to just call the river pretty much no matter what. And so I call and then the river comes and it's another Jack. So it's like, hey, Jack's full of threes. Well, you know, so now he bets and now I raise. And I think a little while before I raise, and he's put like 3000 for his bet and I make a raise. And then he immediately grabs like all of his big chips and throws out a re-raise to like 23,000. And he only has a couple thousand behind. And I just kind of like, okay, I, you know, like if you have jacks full of nines or jacks full of sevens, like fuck my life, I'm going to lose, you know, but I say all in and then he snap folds. What? For his like, la he has like two or three thousand left. He snap folds, oh. you know. So it's like, oh, well, that means obviously he had to have been bluffing. And then a little while later, someone else at the table who had like gone left our game to like go to the bathroom and has come back, and he's like, oh, I overheard that guy talking to some friend of his saying that he had pocket nines and he knew it was no good and folded. And I'm like, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> when it comes three seven nine Jack Jack. You don't give me credit for Jack's full and save 2000, you know, into a pot of over 50,000. Like it doesn't work that way. Right. That's called, <laughs> so that's called saving he face. Just, <laughs> he just wanted to, I just want to bluff the, you know, the main event champion. I think that's all there was to it. He just wanted to bluff me. And so he tried and he gave me like 26,000. <laughs> I mean that that is that is the one of the benefits of being a main event champion 
And I spoke to Chris about this as well last week when he was on the show, how you, Chris, and Joe Hashim became sort of the trident for poker stars traveling around the world and promoting the game in, in various different events and in televised events and also in you know the EPT and over in Asia and then and across the U.S. Um, what was that time like where you, Chris, and Joe were the big ambassadors of poker stars and you guys were sort of like a tra traveling band almost? Oh, yeah, they ended up going around the world a good bit. I mean, I remember a trip that lasted, I think, almost two months with us in Europe and just going to like a different country almost every day and making some kind of appearance in the poker room in that town, you know. So we're down in Italy, maybe, and up in Stockholm and, you know, England and Ireland and, you know, France and Germany and everywhere. Um, and it was mostly a lot of fun. I mean, they're nice guys. They're good to hang out with. All of us, you know, we're family men. We all were like married, had kids and stuff. So, you know, we had things in common. And uh, and they're just nice guys. You know, they're nice people. So, you know, they would be someone you would like if you just knew them as the guy next door or whatever. Um, and uh, I used to make a lot of extra money playing some of the card games on the plane when we traveled and stuff. <laughs> we used to play 17 card Chinese poker and that was back before the uh, open face had been invented. And most people, when they played would, it was just 13 and you'd set three different hands playing 13 card, you know, for people today, fantasy land, you know, right, but right, right. you're setting five, five, three in fantasy land. Um, you know, and back then you only got dealt 13 cards always not 14 or more like they do now in fantasy. Um, but we created a version with 17 cards where you played five card high in the back and a three card high on top. And then the four and a five card hand in the middle were Badugi and Deuce to seven. Oh, wow. That sounds good, so, actually. I like, I like that game. That's a good addition to it. I've never seen it play, played with four, four uh, hands to set. That's kind, of, that's kind of a different angle on it. Yeah, and then... The only problem is we could never come up with good royalties because it's just too easy to make, you know, nut badoogies and nut deuce hands and to make quads are better in the back even is or trips up top just isn't that hard. Um, you know, it's hard to do like all of them at once or even three out of four like that, but it's not that hard to do one or two of those almost every hand. So it never made sense to like, oh, you get a royalty for making quads. Be like, you know, people are making quads and straight flushes a lot. Ooh, this is a big pot. This is a good example of poker then versus poker now. All right, so give me your give me your thoughts. Well, he I'm the chip leader. He's one of the big stacks. He's raised, or I think, under the gun. And I've called him with the sixes. And now on this flop, he, he bets, and I raise, and he just snap shoved for a huge amount. And it's again, it's like, what are you accomplishing there with ace 10? You know, you're not going to ever get called by worse. And you are only going to get a couple of better hands to fold. Like maybe I can get away from, you know, ace jack and ace queen. And maybe I even get away from ace king. But I'm not going to fold two pair or three of a kind. So it's a, it's a shove that just doesn't have any real value to it. And you saw that kind of play a lot back then of people just decided, I think I have the best hand. So bam, I'm going to put it in and win this pot now before you make something and beat me. Yeah, because, you know, the sayings back then were also kind of funny and, and they sort of also explained how people thought. And there was also always kind of stuff like, it's better to win a small pot than to, than to lose, a, lose a big one. And they, yeah. ap they applied that the wrong way by saying that, you know, by making a bigger raise, people fold, which of course means you lose value. But that was sort of the thinking back then. And, you know, Davin Anderson here, who was featured on the broadcast quite a bit leading up to this point, just gave, yeah. his, gave his stack to you. And I believe that from this point onwards, you were the chip leader until the end. Yeah, I think I was already the, the chip leader at the beginning of that day. Um, but that one really vaulted me way up. Like, I don't remember the exact numbers at this point, but like if I was the chip leader with, you know, 1.8 million, it's like, well, then he just punted off a million to me there. Right. And so now I'm way, way, way ahead of everyone else. Um, and basically had a pretty huge lead all the way to the end at this point. Um, but again, it's not so much that he lost that pot. I mean, he was obviously going to lose no matter what, but he didn't necessarily have to lose all of his chips. 
And if he was going to lose them all, it, you didn't want to do it like that. <laughs> Cause when he, when he, you know, when he three bet shoves at that point, it's like, you know, what is he really accomplishing? You know, again, he's never getting called by a worse hand. And there's only a couple of better hands that he might get to fold. But people didn't think about that issue. They just thought, do I think I have the best hand? If I think I have the best hand, then that's then I'm going to be betting and raising. Um, now we understand concepts like, oh, let's keep your bluffs in the pot. You know, let's not raise with this hand because I want to keep your bluffs in there. Those kinds of thoughts really didn't exist back then. By the way, we just saw Chris Moneymaker win the Blind Man's Bluff tournament from the 04 yeah. World Series of Poker. I mean, that's one title that he uh, he should have on his Hendon mob. I don't see it on there. but uh, um, It's not on his Hendon mob, but he mentioned it on Twitter today. No, that's because I, I called him out for it. Oh, ah, okay. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I shared the screenshot because I was preparing for this episode um, watching I'm, this. I'm the World Series of Poker wiffle ball champion as well, but no one ever brings it up. Oh, wow. Was that in 05? It was one of these nut segments. I don't know that it was 05, but we had Oral, Oral Hershiser pitching. And it was, you know, you and, and the poker players were just taking our turns at the bat. And it was like, who could hit the ball the furthest on their turn? And we had two heats, you know, with like one and two advancing from each heat, I think it was. And then the four of us did the finals. And I won the finale by bunting <laughs> after no one else got a hit. <laughs> That's incredible. So it's like I still have like the autographed wiffle ball that because I had oral autograph the wiffle ball for me. And so I still have that packed away somewhere with the other with the, the glasses and the other stuff. That's an awesome story. I mean, those nut segments were tremendous. And for the people watching and maybe this is the first time you're seeing it when you are reliving the World Series of Poker main event from those past years start at the beginning and go all the way through because it tells a story and it also gives you some incredible segments and one of them phil helmy shirtless waking up and doing yoga but also <laughs> greg raymer playing wiffle ball against oral hershiser which is also funny to think about even when you say it out loud it sounds kind of, sounds kind of crazy but um a lot of stuff was organized over the yeah. years and um, i don't i don't even know if that video is available anywhere like i've never seen it since um you know, and I know for sure that like having recently reviewed the 04 DVDs for my upcoming books that I'm currently writing, they definitely edited out some stuff. Like everything that was on TV at the time is not necessarily on that DVD. Right. So like what we're watching now is the edited. This is probably from the DVD. Oh, I can't be sure about that. I don't know if, there's a, if Poker Go has another source <laughs> for the material other than the DVD. Well, the, the, interesting, um, the interesting part about that is that um, we basically have all the footage that as it was aired on ESPN. So I am yeah. I am pretty confident this is everything because I spent a lot yeah. of time digging through this footage to uh, make it ready for uh, publication again. So I think that maybe the DVD was a shorter cut of these versions, um, but this is all that was aired ever. Well, it's possible the main event is identical. Like right. if you get that DVD somewhere on eBay or someplace, you know, where you could still find a copy because I don't think anyone sells new copies of it anywhere. <laughs> um, but if you found a copy, the, the coverage of the main event might be exactly what you have. But I know that the, the Tournament of Champions thing, the Invitational that Annie Duke won, that there was definitely some of that that was aired on TV that did not get onto the DVD for, for whatever reason. Yeah, that's, that's um, kind of interesting. I think it might have just been because the DVD only had so much capacity back then. And it's like, we got all these other extras on the second DVD and we couldn't fit in everything. Yeah, no, so that, what are we gonna what are we gonna exclude? That's very possible. Uh, we're seeing a string of eliminations here as they quickly chop down the field to uh, sort of speed the coverage up a little bit, and um, that brings us to uh, some changes at the feature table. But it's also cool to see that they turn they filmed this in almost like a documentary style where they were focused in on a few personalities that they really followed, and then some people like you know the guys that we just saw they finished between. 32nd and, and 25th and we never saw them play a single hand uh, while nowadays of course there is so much more extended coverage which makes it a bit more boring because you see so much more of it 
but at the same time it also gives <laughs> gives more people a chance to get their moment on tv compared to uh, how it used to be and you greg of course had a lot of chips and you had the fossil man glasses which you know had you catch the eye of the tv production you know prior to the final table which was also helpful for building your story yeah i mean they asked me to come in early after like i don't know the third day or something just to do an interview about the glasses and uh so if I had just busted out the first hand that next day, you might have still seen a little bit of me right. here on TV, but obviously a lot less. Yeah, and then and, and that all spirals and sort of snowballs into what this. Um, I, I, it's not even a roller coaster. It's more like a, a jet rocket going to the moon. Uh, as far as sitting on a large stack and and running over the tournament, um, were you ever nervous at any point? Were you ever sort of scared for the moment because there was still $5 million at stake? Not really. And I'm always kind of surprised. I mean, I even use this terminology myself sometimes almost by accident, but people talk about like that was a scary river card or, you know, you know, they use the words scary and fearful in, in those kinds of words. And I'm always kind of like, this is a game. It's not like this isn't the, uh, you know, like the uh, Aztec ball game and the losing team gets sacrificed to the gods at the end of the game. You know, we don't die if this doesn't work out. By you the way, just I, either lose money or don't win as much. Let's listen to Josh Arie and uh, let me hear your take after this, Greg. Arie sees that he is in trouble. And Josh also motioning to, to Harry. He's upset that Harry put them all in with what Harry's cards are. Interestingly, Harry's got the better hand line. Josh right now is just on a draw for his tournament life. So Josh Arie could be gone from this tournament after such a powerful run. The turn card is an eight, and Dimitriou's aces are still best. So Josh down to perhaps his final card. He needs a jack or a heart, or he will finish in 19th place, and this session will end. River card. Oh, it's a heart. That's right. You're going to put all your chips in with ace jack like that, huh? We can gamble. We're going to get it's on now. It's on now. You got lucky, simple as that. I didn't get lucky. You put your hand in where you put your, ooh, wee. You made a good call. You got lucky, simple as that. What is it? No class from Josh here. No class at all on. Josh just crippled Dimitriou with that win, and he's rubbing it in. Uh-oh. What are you complaining? You got the chips. I'm not complaining at all. You just show a little humility. You're not supposed to, you're not supposed to rub it in. You're supposed no, to show a little it. humility. That's all I'm saying. Take it inside. Yeah. Well, I apologize. Uh, I'm tired of seeing guys act like punks and then apologizing, Lon. So Josh survived. So was Josh Arie really a punk? I know we touched on this briefly before, but this was, of course, very out of line, getting upset at the player who had him at risk, and he also had the worst of it. Yeah, to be honest, you see that a lot from this from the hyper aggressive players, where you know they're they're very loose, very aggressive, you know, raising, 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 coming in all the time, and then they seem to get upset if you call them even slightly light. <laughs> And it's not, you know, this is top pair. It's not even that light. Um, you know, if, if Harry had called him with Queen Jack, it's like, oh, wait, bot you called me with bottom pair? I mean, th third pair, you know, whatever. Um, but it's it's something you I've seen a lot over the years from these players who they kind of like, you know, hey, you're not supposed to call with that. It's like, well, I wouldn't have called Dan Harrington with that, but I'm going to call you. And that's like, the, you know, when I played that first main event, when I went bust, it was one of those kinds of scenarios where, you know, I was always surprised at how other players at the table reacted on that hand because, I mean, what had happened is I'm the big blind, I have ace, queen of hearts. There's a guy at my table who's super loose, super aggressive, playing the very much what you would call the maniac style. He raises, it folds to me. It's just like, okay, his range is any two cards, basically. So I re-raise with the ace queen, and now he snap shoves, you know, having me covered by quite a bit. And I'm just sitting there, and it's like, this is a four bet all in. And at that time in 02, it's like, that's supposed to be aces, maybe kings, maybe queens from a guy who's drunk or something, you know. <laughs> so ace queen of hearts isn't supposed to be any good, but I'm just sure it is. And I sat there for a while and and i just couldn't shake the my belief that like he was completely full of shit and had any two cards 
And then finally, I just said, I can't fold the best hand I call and turn my cards over. And everyone else at the table looked at me like, you're a fucking idiot. Like ace queen, there's no way that's the best hand. Like maybe he has jacks and you have a, a flip, but you know, everyone's looking at me like I'm a total idiot. And then he, he looks at me and he does this little head bob thing. Like, and then he turns over 10, four off suit. Wow. And everyone at the table now looks at me again. Like, how could you know that? And I'm thinking, how can you not? I mean, yeah, he might've had a good hand, but he's been doing this to all of us for hours. Why are you guys still giving him credit for having a big hand when it's doing it over and over and over? And then I hit a queen on the turn that gave him a straight. Oh, yeah, so yeah, yeah. it was like eight, nine Jack and then queen on the turn. His 10 makes him a straight. I'm out of the main event. I mean, so I go from like 80,000 chips or so to out and, uh, you know, oh, well. On to the next one. Uh, for the people in the chat, let, let us know what you think about Josh Arie's behavior. And, you know, in the broader context, how do you feel about a bit of taunting, a bit of, I guess, I, I don't want to call it banter because banter has that positive connotation to it. But, you know, players who are being a bit negative and who want to be the villain, how do you guys feel about that? Let us know in the chat. I'm very curious to see what the audience thinks about that one. Um, meanwhile, we are moving into um, one of many David Williams double ups in this event because he, of course, was sort of sitting on a short stack for the entire tournament, doubling up once he got it in and made his way through the event uh, by probably being in the most showdowns of any player who made it down to the final table. Had it, having his mom on the rail was obviously great to see, and he was oh, he was tutored he by his uh, backpack on. That was why he won. <laughs> yeah, the he old... put on the backpack. He put on the backpack early, like okay, you know the the old. Uh... The Everyone knows that move. You get out of your chair, put on your backpacks, you know, get, grab your stuff. <laughs> all right, all right, Greg. Here we're seeing the, the chip counts. I mean, this is pretty insane. Looking, looking at you sitting over almost 6 million chips. Arya just, of course, um, busted Harry Dimitriou by first doubling through him and then busting him on the, on the following hand. Um, you could have cruised and not played a hand and you know, would have still made it to like the final five probably. I think at this point we're down to 18, two tables remaining. Um, just an incredible position and we're getting into the nitty gritty here of the penultimate day of this, uh, this main event. Um, yeah, but you don't want to cruise, you know, it's like, <laughs> this is where you can, you know, when you get a big stack, this is where you can really, you know, that's why having a big stack is so valuable because you can use it, you know, basically as a tool to take more chips from other players. Right. Um, I'm not saying you should be playing crazy. Um, you cannot bully anyone unless they let you, that you know, all you can do is get them all in, but you will find when you're the big stack, especially like this, where, you know, you're on these intermediate bubbles and like, oh, if I survive one or two more spots, I can move up to a much bigger payday. You are going to find that, you know, there's plenty of opportunities to get people to fold the best hand, as long as their hand isn't, you know, something too strong. And, and so you need to look for those opportunities and go after them when you're the big stack. But, you know, it's that balance of like, I'm looking for every spot where I can steal, but I'm not going to go one step beyond that. So it's like sort of controlled aggression, but you're still keeping, yeah. you're keeping the pressure on because everyone else is more worried about the next payout than you are. Yeah. So, I mean, if it folds to you on the button or the cutoff, now you might just be correct to raise with exactly any two cards. And if you only get one caller, then you're going to see bet every flop. And unless they have something, because I mean, deuce Jack eight, you know, and you still have enough chips, even if you have an eight, you might check fold because you're like, eh, what if he, I know he's being loose and aggressive, which means he can have every Jack X combo. And he can also just happen to have been dealt a big pair. So you might decide, do I want to call him down, keep inducing bluffs, call him down and, by the river, I have to put all my chips in the pot, or do I just give up early? Right. Uh, people. So it's it's tough. It's a tough balance to to figure that out. But that's your goal is the big stack. Exactly. Uh, people in the chat are overwhelmingly saying that they are not a fan of the Josh Arya antics. Um, I must say though, people, without those antics, 
you know, poker would be a little more boring. And we have Marcel Lusk on the more positive side of that with some singing and some uh, cheerful jokes. And then Arye uh, is sort of balancing it out, you know, a bit of sweet, a bit of salt. I personally am a big fan of whenever we have some drama and controversy at the table. Um, Scott Jones is wondering on Facebook, and of course, this moment happened well before the footage that we are watching right now. Why didn't you shake Mike's hand? I think there's an obvious uh, answer to that question, but I'm, I'm going to ask it anyway. Well, I mean, he's just saying nasty stuff to no real purpose. And then it's like, ah, just kidding, you know? And it's like, think of some classic movie scene where like the jock is picking on the nerd and then the principal walks up and he's like, oh, we're just teasing. It's just harmless fun, nothing to see here. You know, it's, it's more of that demeanor. It's like, it's not really that I feel bad about what I've said. It's just like, well, you know, okay, I'm going to apologize because I should or something. Um, you know, and certainly, you know, if I, if I talk to Mike now, I, I don't feel any animosity towards him at all. And basically because I know that he really didn't have much self-control at this period of history. You know, he's got some issues with his mental health. Instead of having prescription drugs to properly treat those issues, he's self-medicating with street drugs at this point in time. You know, and he talks about all that in his book. And uh, and I had seen many other incidents with him and with uh, Helmuth, you know, who are both famous for berating players and teasing them, who, you know, they'll say that thing and then immediately kind of go, oh, that was too much. And, and sincerely apologize to the person. But if it was at a filmed table, by the time they edit it, you often didn't see the apology. Yeah, no, that, that, it's also the filmmakers who have so much control. You never really know what they're going to show at the end of the day. Hey, I didn't realize Mike Sexton was still in the audience then. I just saw him sitting there. I was like, I didn't remember him being around. But, yeah. you know, I wasn't paying much attention <laughs> to the audience. So. Yeah, no, that, that's funny to see all the people in the background while this was all sort of unfolding. And David Williams' story is something that they really featured a lot, him going to Princeton and then him becoming a poker player and, of course, being yeah. one of the young kids, which you know wasn't very common back in those days. Um, it, it is definitely cool to see how the big-time players from that era were much more involved in how the main event was playing out. If you see 03, Eric Seidel is sitting in the stands the entire time during the final table. Right now, we're seeing Mike Sexton and a whole bunch of, like Devil Fish was in the background. Chris Ferguson was still watching, even though he had already been out. Um, how, how big was this moment the night before? How late did you guys play? How tiring was it to get down to a final table? And, you know, were there ever sort of mini celebrations where you were like, okay, tonight, you know, we're going to have at least a few beverages to relax for, before the following day. What was your process like? And how do you sort of think back of those days before the final table? I don't think we played that late. I mean, I don't remember any of these days being terribly late. We always had plenty of time to where you could, you know, wind down for a little while, at least an hour, you know, get to sleep at that point and then still have plenty of time to have eight hours of sleep and then get up and get cleaned up and eat. And so there was always plenty of time available. The issue for me was being able to stay asleep. I was always so like completely worn out at the end of the day, you know, kind of like, you know, I don't know if you have anything in, in like this, like we have the SATs and stuff here in the U S people right. take those and it's like a full day test, you know, and you, and it's time, you got to get it done in time and it's mentally challenging and you can't stop you know, and take little breaks and stuff. So, uh, you know, you take one of those and you're just worn out, even though it's all mental. And that's how this was for me. And I had no problem falling asleep each one of these nights, but I wasn't staying asleep. So I'd wake up for maybe five to six hours of sleep and then, you know, couldn't fall back asleep. So at the end of the week, I was really tired, but that wasn't because of the scheduling. That was just me personally not getting enough sleep. Right. So then as we are watching this day and for the people who are just tuning in and we're having some new viewers, so just to explain it once again, we are releasing the 2004 main event final table on PokerGo tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. Pacific time, 12 p.m. Eastern. So you get to watch the final table after hearing Greg's commentary today on the day before the final table. But as people are going to be watching that final table tomorrow, what I'm curious about is after you go presto, 
what what are the next few hours like after you win this big event? What is what is a celebration like, and what is sort of that <laughs> that, that that carousel that you end up at in during that time? Okay, well, after I win this tournament on your next episode, um, you're going to be very disappointed with that story. Oh boy! So the final table played out quite quickly. Like we were done in time that to where like it was done. You know, we did pictures and interviews and everything else. You know, and it was kind of like, oh, okay, come back tomorrow and see this person about getting paid unless you want to do it now. And, you know, so that morning of the final table, my wife and daughter had flown from Connecticut. Um, my wife's sister flew from Michigan. My dad uh, flew down from the Seattle area. So they're all there on the rail at that time. And we were done with the tournament and all of the post-tournament stuff in time to go upstairs to my, you know, ratty little hotel room at Binion's that, cause you could get it for like 25 bucks a night. And, and do you even remember the TVs where they had the little crank knob to right. change channels? I didn't know if you were old enough for that. I'm just, so I'm the TV, <laughs> that was the TV. It was like you had like the 13 channels and then is it the VHF or UHF? That's, I guess it's then you go to UHF and then there's a knob that's like a radio tuner for those channels, if any. So, you know, we found like on the little click, like, okay, it's like channels two and four and seven are the three main networks. And it was time for, you know, we were there in time for the evening news at 11. And we're cranking between those channels to see what the coverage would be. Like, what would they show of my win on, on the news there in Vegas? And so we're just kind of click, 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 and then click and, you know, back and forth between those three. And we caught the coverage on two of them. And then it was like, okay, everyone's exhausted. And everyone just went back to their rooms and went to sleep. And that was it. Wow. <laughs> So, I mean, I was probably asleep by midnight, 1230, you know, and rather than staying at Binion's, like my wife had gotten a room, I forget now where, um, what was it called before Planet Hollywood? I think it was like Sahara or something. The uh, Aladdin, I believe. Aladdin. Yeah. I think she had a room at the Aladdin for that, like her and her sister and my daughter were at, and my dad had a room, I forget where, somewhere else. And, uh, you know. And they all had like rental cars and things. So literally like everyone else was like, we're all tired. So they went back to their rooms and I went to mine and that was it. I mean, it was not, you know, I'm not a party animal, so I'm not going out to the clubs and drink. And I, plus I'm allergic to alcohol, so I don't ever drink. Oh, see, that helps. That, um, that helps going to bed I, you know, early. You know, I've never been any, I, I'm not personally opposed to it, but I have no interest in any of the recreational drugs either. So I don't do any of that stuff. I don't, it's not a moral thing or whatever. It just doesn't interest me. Right. And uh, so, you know, like what kind of partying am I going to do? You know? No, that's true. I mean, but most of the people that have won big events, you know, big celebration dinner. Oh, Chris, yeah. Chris, Chris Moneymaker told me how he spent ten thousand dollars on the night after he won. Uh, they ended up at various uh, uh, various establishments. You guys have to watch the episode with Chris. It was really funny the way he yeah. told the story. Chris actually told the story of how he had to get Huxie's phone number to come bring money because he spent more money than he had on him the night that he went out to party after winning the O3 main event. Um, so, what was there a party the following days? Did you guys go for for, for a nice meal somewhere or was it sort of like you know back home and back to the normal routine it was like go back home really i mean like the only reason i didn't go to work monday is that was the holiday wow and then i was back at my office on tuesday after winning and i knew i was going to quit my job but i also did have a few stock options that weren't underwater i was like oh well, i gotta you know if you quit you lose your options Wow, I lost a lot of chips in there somewhere. Yeah, definitely. And they I didn't, didn't even remember any of that. They didn't, um, they didn't show any of that. And, uh, you know, so I just waited till those options came through and I got, the, like, my wife called me like a week or so later. Like, oh, we got the check in the mail <laughs> for those options, like 10, 15,000 bucks. And then I had my pre prepared notice letter. If I just like run away and quit, all I'm doing is like, if you are one of my coworkers, I was basically screwing you over. 
because now you're going to have to dig through my files and figure out what to do in each of these cases that I'm handling. So I spent the next two weeks like getting everything perfectly arranged, you know, with nice little typewritten notes explaining to whoever takes this file, like here are the upcoming deadlines with the patent office and or here's, you know, the important correspondence with the inventor or whatever else. So I just was, you know, because I'm like, you guys are all my friends. I don't want to like screw you over and make you work harder. No, that, that, know, I mean, that, like that's that's great. But you were you were thinking like as you won this tournament, like now I am a full time poker professional because this money allows me to never have to work again. Yes and no. Um, like I had known for several years before I won the main event that like, hey, I'm good enough at poker. I could quit my job and make a living at this. Right. And and I prefer it. Like it's more fun than, you know, I didn't hate my job as an attorney at all. You know, if you're going to work for a living, I always said this is a great job. But poker is more enjoyable. Um, and so, you know, my first thought might have been like, okay, I can quit working for Pfizer and I'll just work for myself part time. You know, there's, I'll be a solo practice lawyer. I'll get a handful of clients, get some guaranteed income coming in the door. And then have plenty of time to go take trips to like, you know, instead of a few days in Vegas at the World Series or, you know, a week, it'll be like, I can go out there for a month. Um, but then, you know, Poker Stars is saying, because I'm wearing their logo for everything up until the final table, because um, I had won my seat online. And then they're like, oh, wait, we're offering you more money, you know, quite a bit more money than Pfizer pays you to represent us full time. It's like, okay, well, now I can't, you know, how do I stay a patent attorney if I can do this that I like more and make more money? So it was a real easy decision then to go pro, but I even wrote one of my articles for Card Player Magazine telling people basically don't quit your job or don't quit school to go pro. It's, it's going to be a mistake for almost everybody. Right. Let's listen to this hand while I turn on the lights here because it's getting really dark here queen in Las Vegas. Release the hand with a pair of queens to the turn card. Now Sharf gets a straight draw. Sharf would need a 10 for a straight or a king on the river to stay alive. Now the river card. And it's a four of spades, and that's not going to do it. Greg Raymer wins the hand. Eddie Sharf eliminated in 15th position. He will win $275,000. Only 14 players remain, and there is your chip leader, Greg Raymer, the player they call Fossil Man. <laughs> it was a strange laugh. <laughs> My wife uh, grew up... So this is the story, as you just ex yeah. exactly told it, about how uh, Fossil Man came to be. Uh, for the people that are watching right now, we are down to 14 players in the 2004 main event, watching it with Greg Raymer, the champ, of course, back from 04. Uh, if you're watching this and enjoying the show, please don't forget to like this video, subscribe to the channel, hit the notification bell if you are on YouTube. We are releasing tons and tons of amazing hands from the past. And um, on Monday, we're starting to roll out our 2005 coverage with the best hands from every year, also condensed into a top five clip that's being released every Wednesday. So we're bringing poker history back to life and hopefully everyone gets to enjoy that as much as I have because I have been watching all this stuff in the last couple of months getting all this stuff ready um if you guys have questions for greg please send them in right now we're down to 14 players so we're making our way slowly but surely to the final table as greg is sitting on an enormous stack which you know is probably the best feeling in the world if you are a poker player sitting on a large stack in a big tournament um Lots of people asking about the past, uh, people asking about the Stu Unger events and how and whether those can be found anywhere. Um, we're working on it. Um, if, if anyone will have them, we will have them. So still working on that footage. But uh, yeah, let's catch another hand here as uh, Greg's about to get involved here with the Ace-4 offsuit. Over to D. Archer. See, the the, the at necklaces at I'm wearing, seven. those are like little chips of like semi-precious stones. So like little like low quality uh, garnets or something for the red and all that. So when I go to these rock and mineral shows to buy more fossils, I'd be like, oh, well, this is something people might like. And usually my customers were like, it'd be like someone like you who has a son who's like, let's say five to 15. And you're like, oh, my kid loves dinosaurs and stuff. He'd love having this 300 million year old fossil, you know, so you'd buy one. And it's like, well, I can have something you can take to your daughter, these little you know, and I was like, hey, this is like real, like, you know, gemstones, you know, tell her that. 
And so I, I sold those also, which is why I was wearing them. <laughs> that is so funny because, I mean, believe it or not, I always thought those were like the Fremont Street drinking attire kind of uh, necklaces. <laughs> no, you could buy those. Like I said, like the, the red one is like actual like little, I think it was garnets. So it's real garnet. It's a real gemstone and all that. But I can go to the rock show and buy that strand of little garnets for, I forget, three, four, five bucks or something. You know, like maybe I'm paying three bucks for it and then I'm selling it for 15 bucks if someone wants to buy it from me. But it's like, no, you can take this home to your like little girl and here's your real gemstone necklace, like real gemstones, you know, not glass or plastic. And it's cheaper than the plasticky stuff you might have bought instead. Right. Uh, people in the chat are wondering, let me actually give credit to the person who was asking it. Um, Max Berkeley is asking, did you change your game as you got closer to the final table? Well, I'm always trying to adjust for the situation, of course. And, and so I don't think I changed in any broader sense. It's more of a, you know, when we're down to like five and six players, you know, you're the big stack and you're shorthanded. You're probably going to find more spots where it's correct to be loose and aggressive and you know as your image changes you know if you've been caught bluffing it's like okay now maybe i need to bluff a little less for a while because people are expecting it more so you're always making those adjustments but i was not doing something broader than that um, i like to try to play every hand for itself so in other words, just for this hand right now, giving everything I know, including these things about your image and stuff as they're changing, what is the smartest way to play this exact hand right now? And so I don't ever do things because like it's gonna create an image, but I try to monitor the image I am creating as a side effect of how I'm choosing to play each hand and, and what people are seeing. So, but I'm certainly not thinking like, okay, I've been playing tight. Now I'm going to open up. It's more of a, is it smart to open up? Right. And if it is, you do it, whether you're the big stack or, 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 or not the big stack. It's just, you're probably going to be more correct to be more loose aggressive when you are a bigger stack. Right. But then at the final table, of course, the pay jumps are massive. Uh, did that have a big impact on your decision-making? Uh, yeah, of course. I mean, it's again, one of those things you're always balancing that there's a pay jump who here is aware of this like here's something you probably wouldn't have heard um even though i've mentioned it a couple of times over the years in interviews matt dean so when we get to the final table he is on my immediate left and he is the second chip leader so that's obviously you know not the way you would prefer it you would rather your opponent um you know with with big with big stacks are on your right where you can have position on them now i had a buddy of mine from back in Connecticut, where I was still living at this time, who I used to play with at Foxwoods, and he had moved to Vegas, become a dealer. And you'll see him in some of these background shots every now and then. Um, he's the one holding up a big sign at, at every now and then, like, go Fossil Man or something. So he uh, gives me some intel the morning of the final table that he was talking to one of Matt Dean's friends and was told that Matt's plan was to really sit back and play super tight until we were down to whatever it was, like five or six people where the, you were going to get at least a million bucks. But until that point, his plan was to sit back and play really tight. So that's just like ridiculously valuable information that kind of like, oh, I can still like be fairly loose and aggressive attacking the blinds. And I don't have to worry about him behind me like three betting me or something using his position to take those steals away. Yeah. I mean, any kind of information like that is so valuable, especially at a big final table like that. And, uh, you know, that all worked out for you perfectly, which is really cool to look back on, but there's so many, there's so many what ifs for all the players that did make oh, it, yeah. that, that did make it this far. Um, for the people in the chat, you know, please oh, keep, yeah, that's a great, that's the great classic poker scene. Here. Oh yeah. I love poker. I love play poker. Yeah, Chow Jang is a legend. Actually, you know what? We we're having we're having fun here. I'm gonna go back and we're gonna play this segment because it's all about things people say at the table, which obviously is 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 a nice sort of moment in time to look back on for the audience here. Yes, they are all players, Marcel. 
Sunny, have you ever brought some? Marcel chatting away as usual, but as we find out in this edition of The Nuts, Table Talk was a big part of this World Series. I only got one thing to say. If you did it out there, they did it out there too, Zoo. Huh? You know what the Lord told me? I think we need to do some group therapy at this time. He says, when you step up to the table, you're on your own. <laughs> I'm allowed to look. <laughs> that's the first thing that wasn't true. I'm wanted for diamond smuggling in Canada. <laughs> that's right, baby. I have like three future ex-wives. Look like, you know, somebody slept with your girlfriend. <laughs> I don't want to give you a complex, but your stack looks small. I love to play poker. I want to thank you again, Annie, for the best sex that I've ever had. <laughs> Spicy hot, baby. That's the way I study life. <coughs> My beat is I feel like a piece of cheese. Yum, yum. Yum, yum. Speak English, man. I can speak Chinese. Chicken chow, man. What would the Swedish word for wow be? Wow. Blibbity blabbity, blibbity blibbity. Where the bagana play more bagana? Now on, you get to silent people. I mean, this is just, it's just so much fun to look back on on these moments. Um, you still get good table banner, but not as much or as often, I think, especially not in a big tournament. Right. Um, overwhelming chip lead, Matt Dean in second place, John Murphy, who would not make the final table in third, Matt Dean and John Murphy about to clash in a pot that really, um, you know, swung the tournament because, uh, Murphy was a, a dominant force up until that point. Let's uh, watch this hand. Reaching for chips. He'll put out 140,000. How can Matt Dean be yawning? He's closing in on a million dollar payday or more. <laughs> He just knocked out Kevin Bott. Now he's looking at a couple of jacks. Can't get away from that. He'll raise to a half million. As we count down Instant raise. So it goes 140 to 500, like within a matter of seconds. And these guys yep. are second and third in chips. And one of the strongest, John Murphy has just moved all in for his two and a half million John was very loose, very aggressive, and he played well, you know, as far as you could judge, you know, based on what I've seen on TV and what I saw there at the table when I played with him. So let, let's break this one down real quick. So um, a raise in a three bet, and then Murphy shoves. Murphy is third in chips. Dean is second in chips. Um, from Murphy's perspective, he knows that it's going to be really tough for Dean to call that, but three bet ranges were very tight back in those days. From Dean's perspective, four bet shove ranges were extremely tight back in those days. And then for Dean, for his jacks to be good, the only hand he's really hoping for is either a complete bluff, which is very unlikely, or ace king. So, uh, Greg, are, are both players making a mistake here? Is that possible? I mean, especially when you look at it from the ICM point of view. Um, essentially, unless the other guy folds, I am committing ICM suicide because like you said, it's like, he doesn't expect to ever be shown tens or, or worse. I don't think it's like, he's like, yeah, shaking his head. Like, yeah, yeah, I got it. Like two jacks, but it's like, you know, 57%. Um, if you knew at the start of the hand, you were going to be all in 57, 43, both of them should be saying no, thank you to that when it's all or most of their chips. Yeah, and the ICM implications of this one are just staggering because whoever wins this hand is basically cruising and in second place right behind you with a massive gap to third place. So neither of yep. them should want to take this risk because they both have a stack that's big enough to make that final table and to get a few more pay jumps. But obviously, as we see right here, Matt Dean gets the check mark on the turn and knocks out John Murphy, who gets eliminated shy of the final table uh, in 13th place for 275K. And we basically never see him again. So this was his moment in time. One coin flip sort of ended his story and also maybe, maybe it even ended his poker career we don't really know but it is definitely insane to think that it i am 100 percent sure that was me telling him like how great he played right. just then i was shaking his hand and stuff and basically that's what i was telling him that you know you played great you were super tough i did run into him i i think it was at commerce a while later um like several months later because i remember i asked him about a hand that was not on the feature table where i laid down pocket kings to him pre-flop and it was one of only like a couple of times in my life that I folded kings pre-flop. And and I felt, I was like, sure, he had aces or kings. And when I saw him, you know, we were chatting. And one of the things I said was like, do you remember this hand? You know, like, you know, I'm curious because I made a really big fold. And 
and he said he had kings. <laughs> so wow. he had, it's like both times that I have been able to find out what the other guy had and I folded kings, they had the other two kings. <laughs> That's really funny. <laughs> Wow. All right. We are on the bubble here of the final table. Marcellus took off the jacket. Might have been a little bit warm under the bright lights here. Um, but let, let's listen in on uh, the action sort of resuming here with just 10 players remaining. And Matt Dean is in second place on the chip count right now. He looks like he can't believe he's here. David Williams could become the youngest player ever to win the main event. Phil Helmuth currently holds that title. The unheralded Al Crux trying to make it to the main event final table for the third time. Very few people can say that. And here's one of the few who can. Dan Harrington, already three final table appearances. And of course, he won it all in 95. And at this point, Lon, a lot of the players are just thinking survival. Nobody wants to be the last one to be knocked out before the final table. Glenn Hughes in his fifth World Series of Poker is in line yeah, to I would say down. at this point, when we, we were 10-handed for quite a while. And the only people still playing to like really accumulate chips were me, Josh Arier, and um, your fellow Dutchman, Marcel Lusk. Everyone else was mostly, you know, playing tight, avoiding risk. Well, it's a good thing you mentioned that at this point because Hughes puts in a raise from the button with nines and then Marcel's in the big blind. So let's have a look. We're going to have a look. The only person who announces he's going to look at his cards. Go to Jack. Actually, he's going to have two looks then, right? He needs two looks. He's got an ace. Ace Jack. Put it all in. And so Marcel with the ace Jack will push 960,000 chips into the pot. So uh, even though this seems super standard right now, back then that was pretty aggressive, right? Well, and especially in this spot, it's not so much that it was so super aggressive. I mean, it was reasonable for that point in time, not over the top. But I would say at this point, at this final table, Besides myself and Josh, I'm not sure anyone else would have risked their whole stack, you know, and not have felt like I'm in fairly close to a lock position. So they would have, you know, like, oh, ace jack, you know, it's a button raise. I could have the best hand. And and even if I don't, he might fold. Um, I think most of the other six players would have either called to see a flop or if just folded and hoped someone else goes broke and they can make the final table and the pay jump because there's a fairly significant pay jump here from 10th to 9th. Next player to go out will miss a chance to be at the final table. You're right, and Marcel would not want Hughes to call here. He's behind in the hand, and Marcel would go out and he's to <laughs> lose this. And maybe it'll take him out on a stretcher. He's so tired. We meet again, my friend. <laughs> Hughes falls. We meet again. We meet again. I mean, again, show it, show it, show it if it's better, show it. Show the crowd, give the fans something to cheer about. I don't want to make you. I give them something to cheer about. I don't want to make you. I don't want to make you. It's ridiculous. Luke showed his ace jack. I don't want to make you look ridiculous. In hindsight, are you, would you have wished Marcel was there for the entertainment value at the final table? Sure. <laughs> you know, but. You know, for, from that perspective, of course, from any other perspective, I mean, he's got, you know, more experience than anyone else at this final table other than Dan Harrington. Right. So from that point of view, you know, I'm glad for him to be eliminated because, you know, however the chips are distributed, if they're not moving to my stack, you know, I would rather they move to stacks of people who are either less skillful or less experienced or both. Right. Yeah, no, that makes a ton of sense. But yeah, it's it's definitely one of those what ifs, like you you and and Marcel playing heads up. I mean, that would have been a completely different type of show uh, than what it turned out to be in the way things played out. I mean, David Williams making oh, it yeah. was was like Williams making that heads up was just like probably the longest shot ever of anyone um, making it that deep. And I'm not saying anything against David Williams's game. Just the way it played out was like he was never yeah. he was never a favorite to make it to heads up at any point. No, you're right. He was always one of the shorter stacks remaining at the table for the for the majority of the final table. Right. Um, you know, but I've won some tournaments like that and certainly not main events. Or, but I mean, I've won tournaments where I've I run a limit hold'em tournament way, way back um, where I was literally the shortest stack at every point in time until I took the chip lead heads up. Wow. 
That's... I mean, even when someone else would go broke, it'd be like, I started the hand with less than them and they went broke, you know, kind of a thing. And that was limit hold'em, which of course is always different, but you know, and when we got heads up, it was like this lady, super hyper aggressive player. And people are just like, man, she's got you mean like 10 to one in chips. They're like, just give up. Like, don't even waste time. Just take second. And, you know, I'm like, why would I ever do that? No matter what, even if I thought I had no shot, it'd be like, why would I just give up? I got nothing to gain from that. Um, you know, but then like I flopped a set and she like went six bets with me on the flop or something. So, wow. With no pair and no draw, just trying to get me to fold. That's impressive. Here you are battling on the bubble with uh, Lusk. You making a flush on the turn, or sorry, making a straight on the turn against the Marcel's middle pair. Yeah. I kind of misplayed this hand though. You want to make it 325? It's more easy. Because I. Am I allowed to do that, man? He wanted me to make it 325 instead. No, uh, because it's more easy. Otherwise, I'm ending up having this. I don't want to know. OCD. You know, yeah, it's you know. so funny. <laughs> he, wa he wanted you to bet more. Marcel wanted to do some housekeeping. And now the turn card and is a hard, and Raymer has made that flush he was looking for. He'll check, hoping Marcel will bet. Unless I thought I was going to induce a bluff, that was a bad check. Right. Raymer flips over the winning card. It's like the fact that I don't have the nuts, that there's one f higher flush possible. If that was why I checked, then it's horrible. If I really thought he was going to bet it, then it was okay. But I think it was probably just a bad check. Yeah, so, shame on me. I mean, Marcel definitely known as an aggressive player. And there was a chance he made a smaller flush given that he called you down. But still, ranges, of course, skew more towards big cards in that situation. Um, but it's also sort of hard to be critical on yourself um, so many years after the fact. Oh, I'm not really being hard on myself, but I, and I wouldn't have been checking because I th if I thought he had a flush, I would be jamming all in and expecting a call. Right. It's more of a like, ooh, will if I check, will that look weak and now he will try to bluff me with a hand that will never call a bet. Um, I probably should have just gone for value and bet it. Another game changer hand here. David Williams getting involved. Let's uh, listen in. And the raise now over to Josh Arie. Couple of tens. How much more you got, boss? It's funny. I'm pretty sure you're not required to actually answer that. You just have to like make your chips visible. Right. That's true, actually. 600 is a bit. That's an odd bet. If, if David Williams is going to play this hand, he'd be going all in. He, he just asked him how much he had. He's bet 150000 less than David Williams has. Well, if I'm supposed to be 10th, I'm supposed to be 10th. All in. I like his style. Right, oh, well, he's got style, but right now he doesn't have the better cards. He's an underdog here to stay alive. If we lose David Williams, we've got our final nine playing for $5 million. Don't fear. I'm here. Don't fear. He looks pretty scared. Here. He looks absolutely <laughs> terrified. Yes. I don't blame him. I mean, you know, it's 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 a huge moment where you're just like, you know, just the lucky cards are gonna cost me or make me millions of dollars. And now the turn card. It's an ace. David Williams grabs control with a pair of aces. It's funny. I did some uh, ICM analysis the other day just because I was curious. So I looked at all of our chip counts at the start of this final table nine-handed and I calculated our ICMs and then what we actually all won. Right. So I was not the biggest winner at the final table. It was David Williams. Wow. He yeah. increased, you know, his second place prize increased his equity by more than my equity going into the final table. Then I increased it by winning. And how much so he was the big winner at the final table. Matt Dean was the bigger, biggest loser since he went from second place and got knocked out like sixth or seventh. Right. Um, but, you know, so, I mean, David didn't win the tournament, but he won the most money on that day. Yeah, I mean, the funny, I was going to say Matt Dean lost the most because he, of course, yep. had a great situation, but he um, didn't find a way to, to make that work, which, you know, is kind of too bad for him. And he also never really, you know, 
he, he never really had another chance at it, but still he had that big run. And now here David Williams doubles up through Josh Arie, giving him a stack big enough to make it to the final table. Yeah, I, I still I have my notes. Actually, they were close to hand here. So oh, really? David started the final table with 1.4 million. And uh, or no, I'm sorry, his equity at the start of the final table was to win $1.4 million. And he got three and a half million. So he increased his equity by over $2 million at the final table. My, my equity was 3.2 million and I got five. So I went up by a little less than 1.8 million. So he won more cash than I did that day. Wow. In terms of increased over his start of day equity. And yeah, Matt Dean, his equity was 2.58 million and he got paid 675,000. So he lost over 1.9 million in equity. Wow. Between what he got paid in cash and what his equity was to start the day. And only three players actually made money on the final table, so to speak. Uh, Josh Arie finishing third also won over $400,000 more than his start of day equity. Wow. And everyone else lost equity, which really isn't a surprise that the people who finished one, two, three gained some money, gained some equity, and, and the everyone else lost. Yeah, and there was a severe short stack of Matthias Anderson. Like one pay jump would have already probably increased his equity. Um, given that he had almost, he only had like a few big blinds left, right? Uh, I don't remember off the top of my head here, but he, uh, he had an equity of almost a million. Oh, wow. Um, by the way, let's listen in on this hand because this is the hand where Marcel Luce goes he for started, He started with 740,000 chips. Matias oh, he's did. got both hands on all his chips and pushes all in. And it's a risky, dangerous play that a lot of players wouldn't make at this point, Lon. He could just sit and make it to the final table, but Marcel's not here just to make the final table. He's here to win. But he's staring at three over cards on the board. He's hoping Dan Harrington got no piece of that flop so he can drive him out. He knows Harrington's pretty tight, so he's thinking that he can drive Harrington out. What is it, 700? Harrington right now is only on a draw, but it is for the nut flush. I'd say it's a good bet because it's most of Harrington's chips. Yeah, I was actually kind of surprised to see Harrington call here, given how much he only has. He has like a million chips there. It looks like, you know, or less than a million even, and it's going to cost him seven hundred thousand. So it's a, it's a, not a great spot, you know, that you want to make that call. I mean, I'm not saying it's right or wrong. I'm just saying it's not, it's not like snap call, hallelujah or anything. That would give each player eights and sixes, and Harrington would have the better kicker. Turn card. It's a jack, and Harrington has a pair of jacks. And now Marcel Luce is going to need a miracle. He needs a four on the river, or he is out of the 2004 World Series main event. The river card. It's an eight. And Dan Harrington wins the hand. Marcel Luce is gone. What a shame to see Marcel go. And that's the attitude you want to have. Right. You know, when you when you take these beats, whether it was a bad beat, whether it was an ordinary one, just like, OK, you know, it happens. You know, no bitching, no moaning, no whining. No, how could you call or any of that kind of crap? Let's listen to David Williams, who uh, has some kind words to say. And David Williams will go to the final table, but he looks like he lost his best friend and maybe he did in Marcel Luz. Feel bad for myself. I mean, it's like I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for him, you know? He uh, just taught me a lot, you know, after like on breaks and just talking. And it feels bad that, you know, I'm, I wouldn't be here if I didn't know him and he had to leave. Beautiful sentiments there and really a, the start of a friendship and a camaraderie there that obviously will probably live on to this day. Um, Greg, all the people that are watching this right now will get a chance tomorrow to watch the final table of the main event that you managed to win. And I just want to know from you, what are some of the moments that they should look forward to that you have, you know, special memories of, you know, of course, the win. But, you know, are there things that stick out in your mind that you want the people to be aware of? I would say, you know, I just want to mention something kind of funny. And, it, and it's like, as far as I know, none of these shows were edited, like, dishonestly. Okay. Like, it's not like we're going to say after the fact, like, oh, Remco, we're going to show you having Jack 10 and you really had Jack 7. You know, so they weren't, like, lying or anything like that. But 
when it came to the all these things like oh they show some close-up of the player in the middle of the hand you know and it's like oh he's bluffing look at that face it'd be like no 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 those details they would definitely like miss edit on purpose you know so they would do a close-up and it's like that was not necessarily contemporaneous to that hand it was like we like that look we're gonna find a spot to use it and the most blatant proof of that when you watch tomorrow is it's either one of mike mcclain or matthias when i get lucky and because they're the they're like the first two hands is me sucking out and knocking those guys out of the tournament and for one of those they cut to a shot and you see my wife in the audience it's a profile shot like the camera's looking at her from her right side and she's in the front row kind of teary-eyed you know you know we're clapping for matthias or whatever but oh i'm so proud of my honey (laughs) she wasn't there (laughs) she didn't get there until we were down to like six players oh what and 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 they loved that shot of her so much they used the exact same shot the exact same one that like three second clip or whatever it is when josh aria gets eliminated in third Wow. So you get to see that same little profile shot of her in the front row of the audience clapping and stuff twice. And I know like the first time when they were airing the show, I was like, wait, she like the, she had, you know, landed with our daughter at the airport. Her sister was flying in from a different city on a different plane. So they were meeting at the airport. And then it was like, OK, we're going to get a rental car. We found this like 24 seven daycare place for Sophie because she can't be there in the room. Right. You had to be 21 to just be in that room to watch the final table. And they had issues and got lost and did it. And so they showed up quite late and we were down to about six players by the time they got there. So here we are with like either Matt, Mike in ninth or Matt in eighth getting eliminated and they're showing her clapping. And it's just like, no, 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 she wasn't there yet. You, you, that shot couldn't be from that moment, no matter what. Um, and so Every time I would see other shots, there's a hand where Dan Harrington does a squeeze play all in with six deuce. And and I'm not accusing them at all of like, oh, they edited in the six deuce and he actually had a, a good hand in that moment. But they made it look like, wow, he's bluffing six deuce. Like, no, I think Dan's just smart enough to know this is a great squeeze spot and I have the right stack size and it didn't matter what my cards were. I just saw in this spot, I can go all in no matter what. Wow. But at one point, you know, like Josh folds and it's just me and they do a shot of Dan. And as he's sitting here facing forward at the table, I'm like a couple of seats to his right. And they show him kind of like turning his eyes, you know, to the side, like he's, you know, looking nervous and skittish, you know, and it's just like, I was probably staring at him at that point and I don't remember him doing any of that at that hand or any other time, something like kind of like that obvious. So I suspect that was not contemporaneous to that hand either. And, you know, I can't remember things well enough to be sure, but that's to me kind of amusing that uh, these things like that, you know, I make a bet and you're thinking and they cut to you and you're thinking they cut back to me and now I have some kind of smug look because I have the nuts or I have a, you know, cat caught with the bird feather sticking out of its mouth, guilty look, because I'm trying to steal the pot. You know, they'd, they'd show these close-ups of some player with a certain look on their face and be like, yeah, I don't know that that, like, none, I don't trust any of those now. Right. I mean, I think it, they just edit them in any time they felt like it. Right. And it's cool because Chris Moneymaker mentioned the same thing uh, on last week's show for his uh, final table as well, where there were certain moments. Or actually, he mentioned a Dutch Boyd hand that happened just before the final table, where Chris said, like, they showed a close up of Dutch Boyd, like, you know, putting his, his hands in his, in his face. And Chris said, no, that hand was totally, that was like, you know, an hour later when he did that. And they used it for a different moment. Yeah. Um, of course, that no longer happens because poker now is broadcast as a sporting event. And there's yes. continuous footage and there's live streams. But back in those days, 
they did whatever they had to do to make it feel as dramatic as possible. And I think I think it also was part of how poker grew in popularity is because it felt so dramatic, which made yeah. those first couple of years so exciting to watch. And even rewatching it now for the umpteenth time, I'm still enjoying watching this because of how well it's all put together. And I think it's a great moment in time to look back on. Um, for the people that are watching this, please don't forget to like this video, subscribe to the channel, because next week, I have Joe Hashim on the show. Down, like, like and subscribe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. like and subscribe, all that good stuff. Like, I, I got to make... I just, that's what they do in the SNL skits, you know? Like, yeah. You got to like my channel and subscribe when they're making fun of some YouTube person. Exactly. And I mean, that's 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 what I have to do. We got we to gotta make the channel as big as I possible. Get it. I yeah, get it. Yeah, it, it, it is how it works. Um, Greg, uh, uh, parting notes. Um, what are you working on? What's keeping you busy? And of course, we don't know when poker will return, but if it does and when it does, what do you think your plans are going to be? When it returns, I'll try to do what I've been doing. I'll go back on the road to some of these tour events and try to win more money. Um, I will try to book my seminars. That's going to be even harder now because it'll be like, oh, you know, do I even want to go to a group event, you know, right. where I'm paying to be there instead of having a chance to win money. So we'll see if, if those can come back at all. Uh, the live seminars were kind of, you know, been on a big downward spiral anyways, not just mine, but for everyone who used to provide those a lot they're less popular than they had been. Um, my first book has been out for over a year now, Fossil Man's Winning Tournament Strategies. And I'm in the process of writing two more books. So I was going to write one more book and it became two. <clears throat> you know, I was searching for all the hands that, that I could get, you know, evidence of. So like I was rewatching this DVD um, to get some of those details and you know, when they didn't tell us stack sizes, I was freeze framing it, you know, when the camera was on you and I'd be like, okay, I can try to estimate count your chips. Cause I wanted those details there. So I could describe like, you know, here was the way the hand played, but then here is what I did right or wrong. What the other guy might've done right or could have done better. Um, and then I was like, Oh wait, I just won that HPT event in January and that's live stream. Right. You know, and now they're using that software where you get like exact chip counts for every player, every hand, all the details, and when I went back to get all of those hands that might be of interest for the book, it was like, wait, we played 55 hands heads up. Like some of them, of course, you know, are just ordinary hands, you know, oh, I, I raised the button, you fold, you know, but I just thought like, man, there's so many hands. I could just make a whole book on heads up. So I'm going to have the book that goes over 50 or so hands. Um, from the main event when hands I've posted on share my pair over the years. And then the second book will be, I'm going to, I'm writing from scratch, you know, a handful, about a dozen chapters of heads up strategy. And then I'm going to do like a playthrough of all 55 of those hands heads up from the end of that HPT event. And like I said, many of them will be just like, yep, yeah, I raised my button with this and he folded that. And that's all standard, like nothing to see here. But I also might use that as a launch point to say like, you know, oh, see, I raised with this hand, but if it was this little bit worse, then I should have just folded it. And if it was, you know, a little bit better, I, you know, what, you know, so I'll discuss some of those details with those hands. And then of course the hands that get more interesting, will get more discussion, but hopefully those books will be out well before the end of this year. And, uh, so now if you read my first book and you're like, oh, this is great, but, you know, I learned a lot of players just learn better when it's in the situation. So when I just generically say, oh, like you should do this 20 percent of the time, they're like, yeah, but how do I know which 20 percent? Right. Well, now that's what I get to do in this book is say, oh, you know, in Chapter 10, I said this. This is why this situation fits within that criteria for the 20 percent of the time you should check raise. And, and here's why this is one of the good times instead of one of the not as so good times to do it. And the same thing for the heads up book. All right. Well, it sounds like you have a lot going on and it's the perfect way to kill some time before poker returns. <laughs> uh, Greg, thank you so much for doing thank this you. for the people that are watching um, Fossil. Well, at, at, we, we got your highlight for tomorrow. Oh, that's nice. why I had to bust out earlier. Like, okay. I was waiting for like a good shot of it on the video, but they didn't, after I saw like a close up of it, they didn't show it again. So like, yeah, I had that 
not too far away. Oh, beautiful. Um, so, like, that's what we're all playing for. You know, I mean, the money is pretty good, too. But, uh, you know. It, it, I'm, I'm happy to see that it still looks like it's in excellent condition and you're taking good care of it. That is always a, a good thing. Hardly ever wear it. <laughs> no, obviously, it's, it's not something you wear out to the grocery store. But um, if there's ever again a tournament of champions or something of that kind, then hopefully you can uh, bring it out for a special occasion. Um, well, I, I often will take it with me and like bust it out if I make the final table. Yeah, I think it's I think it's awesome. It's it's a you know, it's a really really cool but, thing to see. But I'm also hesitant to travel with it. I'd hate for like my, you know, someone snatches my bag or something and. Right. It's like, oh, I could care less about everything else in that bag except you just took my main event bracelet that you're just gonna melt down and get a few thousand dollars for, and you know, if I was gonna sell it as a souvenir, it could go for a hundred thousand or more. Right. Exactly. Uh, follow Greg on Twitter at Fossilman. That is how you can find him, and follow me at Remco Rinkema. If you have suggestions for who should be on this show, which I'm doing twice a week. Tuesday and Thursday, please let me know in the comments down below and you know, feel free to hit me up on Twitter if you have any questions about this show or about Poker Go shows or whatever else is going on. We're working on big things and I got Joe Hashim on the show next week. Uh, Greg, thanks again. This was Run It Back and we will catch you guys next week. Thank you.